The Dark Portal by Robin Jarvis Read by Tom Baker When a mouse is born, he has to fight to survive. In a borough of London called Detford, there lived a community of mice. An old empty house was their home, and in it they fashioned a comfortable life for themselves. The only blight on their carefree existence was the sewers, or rather, the rats that lived in them, cutthroats and pirates, the lot of them, thin and ugly. A rat would smack his lips at the thought of a mouse for dinner. He would kill, peel, and if he was a fussy eater, roast it. Not that the rats ever came out of the sewers. They had enough muck and slime down there to keep them happy. No, what worried the mice was the grill. This fine example of Victorian ironwork was in the cellar of the empty house. Beyond it lay a passage that led straight to the sewers. The grill, with its leaf patterns of iron, was all that divided them from the bitter cruelty of the rat folk and their dark gods. It was the gateway to the underworld, the barrier between life and death. Only whispering voices would discuss the sewers in case strange forces were awakened by their mention out loud. The mice knew that deep below ground beyond the grill was a power which even the rats feared. And yet the grill seemed to draw mice to it. In one corner there was even a tiny hole edged with jagged rusty iron which a mouse could just squeeze through if he was foolish. One such mouse was Albert Brown. Albert had a wife called Gwen and two children, Arthur and Audrey. He was happy and his family was content, so you see, he had everything to live for. He'd never been brave or overtly curious. So why did the grill call to him that spring morning and what was the urge to explore that gripped him so? Albert had gone quite away before he shook himself and suddenly became aware of where he was. He was on a narrow ledge in a wide, high tunnel. Below him ran the dark sewer water. Albert cursed the madness that had gripped him and sent him running into danger. Alone in the darkness, he sat on the brick ledge trying to quell the panic that was bubbling up inside him. Got to get out. Got to get out. He said, but his voice came out all choked and echoed eerily round the tunnel. This frightened him more than anything. The rats lived down there. Around the next corner, a band of them could be waiting for him. They might have knives and sticks. What if they were already appointing one of them to be the mouse peeler? Albert breathed deeply and wiped his forehead. The only thing to do was to remain calm. If I stay calm and use my wits, then all I have to do is retrace my footsteps, he told himself. It was many hours later when Albert sat down on yet another ledge and wept. He had tried to find his way out, but had been unable to recognize anything that could tell him he was on the right track. He sighed and wondered what time of day it was. Perhaps it was another day altogether. Then he remembered and hoped that it was not. If it was, he would miss the great spring celebration. He would miss the games, the dancing and the presentations. His own children, Arthur and Audrey, were to be presented this year and would receive their mouse brasses. Today would be the most special day in their lives, and he would miss it. In his sorrow... He put a paw up to his own mouse brass hanging from a thread around his neck. It was a small circle of brass that fitted in the palm of his paw. Inside the golden shining hoop, three mouse tails met in the middle. It was a sign of life and an emblem of his family. Suddenly he heard a faint pitter-pat. Something was approaching. From around the corner came a shadow. It sprawled over the ledge, then flew into the darkness of the tunnel. Albert gasped in spite of himself when the shadow's owner finally emerged. It was a mouse. He was left with such relief that he hugged the stranger. Get off, said the mouse, struggling. 
Oh, you've no idea how glad I am to see another mouse, Albert said. The stranger breathed a sigh of relief. Me too. Though you gave me an horrid fry pouncing on me like that, Aunt Piccadilly, who are you? He was a young mouse, a little older than Albert's children. He was grey, which was unusual in the skirtings, and he had a cheeky way of speaking. He had been involved in one of the food-hunting parties in the city when he had lost his comrades. And here I am, he concluded. Mind you, uh, where this is, I'm not sure. Albert sighed. Neither am I. Unfortunately, we could be under Greenwich or Lewisham or anywhere, really. His voice trailed off, and he looked thoughtful. Anything wrong? Albert scratched an ear and looked serious. Well... Apart from the fact that I shall miss my children's mouse brass presentations, as yet I've seen neither hide nor tooth of any rats down here, so it's only a matter of time before we run smack bang into them. Piccadilly laughed. Rats? Slime stuffers? Are you afraid of them? Albert closed his eyes and lowered his voice. Jupiter, he whispered. This is his domain. The young mouse opened his mouth, but no cheek came out. Jupiter, the great god of the rats, lord of the rotting darkness, is he here? Somewhere, said Albert, unhappily. Are the myths about him true? Has he two ugly great heads, one with red eyes and one with yellow? No mouse has seen him, said Albert, but I don't think the rats have either. I've heard he lives in a dark hole and doesn't come out. Piccadilly looked around him. Do you think we ought to find a way out? He said. They set off together, searching the tunnels and exploring deep into black places. Another dead end, said Albert in exasperation. Piccadilly ran his paw over the wall that blocked their path. Do you think we'll ever get out? He asked. Albert took his paw and they sat down. Of course we will. Why, I've no mice in worse pickles than this come out tail and all. Take Twit. Now there's an example. Who's Twit? asked Piccadilly. A young friend of my children. Must be your age, though. Got his brass, you see. An ear of wheat against a sickle moon. He's one of the country mice, then? Yes, a, a field mouse, Twit is. And the smallest fellow to wear a brass I've ever seen. In the dead of winter he came to the skirtings to visit his cousin. In the winter? With the snow and all? Snow and all, said Albert. A terrible journey he had, and many unexpected happenings on the way. Twit's an odd name, mused Piccadilly. Albert nodded. Comes from having no uh, cheese upstairs, if you understand me. Me? Well, that's a tricky one. First sight, yes, but then no. Albert sucked his teeth for a while. If I had an opinion and the right to tell it, it would be the twit is an innocent, as green as a summer field. I think I'd like to meet twit, Piccadilly said. Oh, he and Oswald are a pair indeed. Oswald? Twit's cousin. Tell me about him. Another time, said Albert, getting to his feet. An uneasy fear was growing in him, and he didn't want the younger mouse to sense it. They started off again. Piccadilly ran his paw along the bricks as they went. Albie, I think I've found something here. Come, see. There's a small opening in the brickwork. Albert peered into the hole that Piccadilly had found. It was deeper and blacker than the darkness they were used to, but they could always come back if it turned out to be yet another dead end. The opening was just big enough for them to squeeze through. Once inside they found that they were able to stand quite comfortably, although the dark was unnerving, and they often stumbled over unseen obstacles. Piccadilly? Albert's gentle voice floated out of nowhere. Where's your paw? Come on, lad. I think I see a point of light ahead. It was a dim, grey, rough shape where the passage came to an end. They made for it gladly and peered out, blinking. In front of them, was a large chamber with numerous openings leading off into darkness. Along a ledge nearby, two candles burned. Between the candles was a figure, crouching in an attitude of subservient groveling. It was a rat. He 
He was a large, ugly, piebald creature with a ring through his ear. He had a stump of a tail with a smelly old rag tied around the end. It was Morgan, Jupiter's lieutenant. Looking beyond the orange candle flames, Albert could see an arched portal in the brick. And there, blazing in the shadows, were two fiery red eyes, impossibly large and equally evil. Albert put his paw to his mouth as the awful reality dawned. He didn't need to question the identity of those burning eyes. The powerful evil force that beat out of them was enough to tell him this was Jupiter. Jupiter's voice was soft and menacing. It both soothed and repelled. And why has the digging been delayed? he asked from the dark. Morgan bowed. Lord, he whimpered, you know what the lads are like? What for we doing this, they say. Give me a mouse, fact is. Them right cheesed off. They want action, and now? My people must do all I ask of them, Jupiter said. Do they not love me? Oh, in worshipful adoration, you lovely darkness, more than they love themselves. Love? Jupiter spat with scorn. I am Jupiter. I am the dark thought in their waking hours. I invade their dreams and bring horror. They fear me. Morgan threw himself on the floor. The candles flared and turned an infernal red, so that Morgan appeared to be bathed in blood. Oh, master, spare me! He squealed and buried his snout in his grimy claws. They can spire and grumble, and I'm caught in between. What can I do? The candle flames dwindled in size and returned to their normal color. Jupiter spoke again. Bring them all before me. A demonstration of my unease should quell their mutinous hearts. Leave me. Morgan bowed and scurried away. The two eyes retreated into the black recess and disappeared. The voice, however, could still be heard faintly as Jupiter talked to himself and went over his plans. What's he up to? asked Albert softly. I don't care, and you shouldn't either, said Piccadilly. It's all rat stuff. Nothing to do with us. No, lad, said Albert, taking a step forward. There's some terrible evil here, and it will affect us all. Rats, mice, and the world beyond. I must hear him. You stay here. Piccadilly was horrified. The older mouse crept out into the altar chamber and passed the first candle until he was beneath the dark portal. His paw cupped to his ear as he listened to the designs of Jupiter. Piccadilly paced around inside the passage. Was this mouse cracked? Any minute now, a whole army of rats would come pouring into the chamber. He scratched his head and looked over to Albert. Albert could obviously hear the rat god, and what he heard was clearly not good news. The look of disbelief on Albert's face turned to one of complete shock. Piccadilly tried to warn him, but only a strangled squeak came out. It was too late. Albert felt a terrible pain in his shoulders as they were gripped in sharp claws. Morgan had him and wouldn't let him go. Oh, me lord, cried the rat. See what I, Morgan, have found, a spy. Piccadilly saw Albert swinging by his shoulders where Morgan still held him tightly. Albie, he shouted and ran from the tunnel. Another spy, Morgan shouted. Albert wriggled in the rat's clutches as hundreds more gushed into the chamber. He had no hope of escape. Piccadilly, don't even try. Run as fast as you can. Albert twisted and tore at the mouse brass round his neck. For Gwenny, he called, and threw the charm to the young mouse. Jupiter's voice suddenly boomed. Catch that mouse too, and bring him to me. The teeming force of rats rushed towards Piccadilly, and he ran. Now, Jupiter turned to Morgan. Deliver your spy. I shall peel him myself. As Piccadilly ran blindly in the dark passage over the tumult of the pursuing enemies, he heard Albert cry out. Then, no more. 
sobbing as he fled, he clenched the brass tightly to his thumping breast. Audrey ate a meagre breakfast. Her appetite was small today. It was to be a busy day in the skirtings. The preparations for the great spring festival were already being made. Her brother Arthur had gulped down two helpings and hurried away to join the making of the decorations. But Audrey was not in the mood. Where was her father? It had been a whole day and night since Albert had disappeared. No one had seen him slip through the grill, so nobody knew where to start looking. Come on, Audrey, said her mother, Gwen. A big day for you. You must eat. I'm not hungry, mother. Gwen sat down next to her daughter and cradled her head in her arms. Today I'll get my brass. Audrey looked into her mother's eyes. I'll be a grown mouse. She paused and fingered the brass that hung around Gwen's neck. It was the respectable sign of the house mouse, a picture of cheese formed in the yellow metal. Mother, do you know what my sign will be? No, my love, no one knows, not even the mouse in the green who gives it to you. It's your destiny. Whatever you receive, it will be right for you. Now go and help Arthur and the others decorate the hall while I clear away. Audrey left the table and wandered into her and Arthur's room. She had looked forward to this, her big day, for so long. But now, without her father, it meant nothing. In the hall, all the mice were decorating busily. In one corner were the chambers of summer and winter. Each year these were cleaned and dusted and decorated for the mouse brass ceremony. Into the chambers strode Master Old Nose, carrying a strange straw framework. He was quickly followed by Twit, greatly excited and struggling with a large bundle of leaves and blossoms. Arthur was having a grand time. He was in the middle of it all, hanging up boughs of flowering hawthorn. Oswald Chitter was trying to help him, but mostly he was just getting in the way. Oswald was an albino, which meant that there was no colour in him at all, except for his eyes, which were pink. It also meant that he was so weak that he often found it difficult to join in some of the rougher games. He was, however, very tall, perhaps too tall for a mouse. He was painfully conscious of this and was apt to stoop. What sort of a brass do you think you'll get, Arthur? he asked. I don't know. Probably nothing too exciting. Come on, let's try and find Twit. Oswald shook his head. Cousin Twit went with Master Old Nose, but here's your mother and Audrey. Oh, warned Arthur. I spy your mother advancing. Mrs. Chitter had seen Gwen arrive and made a beeline for her. My dear, she breathed, you must be grieving. Audrey frowned. She didn't like Mrs. Chitter at the best of times. Grieving for what? she asked stubbornly. Oswald's mother blundered on. Why, your darling father, of course, absent now for so long. She held out her paw to console Gwen Brown. Audrey looked at her mother. Her eyes were moist. What was this silly mouse trying to do? Arthur and Oswald joined them. Oh, mother, Oswald interrupted. Have you told Mrs. Brown what you heard last night? Mrs. Chitter brightened. A new field of tittle-tattle had been opened for her. Why, no, Gwen, you can't have heard, can you? That travelling person is back, that awful rat woman with the shawl who came last year, the one with the foreign name. Arthur pulled Audrey away. Good, he said. She'll gabble on about Madame Aki Kuyu for ages. It might take Mother's mind off things. She's an insensitive, stupid nibbler, fumed Audrey. Just wait till Father gets back. Arthur looked at his sister. Audrey, he's been gone too long. Today of all days he'll be here. He'll be here, she said. I know he will. Then everything was ready. The garlands were all in place and the chambers of summer and winter complete. A trio of musicians struck up a merry tune and from out of the chambers came Master Old Nose. Normally he was tutor to the young ones, but today he was the mouse in the green. He was inside a straw framework which he had covered in leaves and blossoms, and here and there little bells had been hung which tinkled as he danced. Everyone clapped and sang. The celebrations had begun. Gwen Brown was pulled into a corner by Oswald's mother. Well, she is gifted, you know, she continued. 
She has a crystal in which she can see things, and she sells love filters and all sorts of potions and medicines. Normally, I'd be the last person to go within smelling distance of a rat, but she isn't one of the sewer kind, you know. She's a foreigner, and they're different, aren't they? Oh, I don't know, said Gwen. I've never had any dealings with rat folk, and I've no desire to start now. If I wanted to know the future, I think I'd rather speak to the bats. Oh, poo! And come away with half a dozen stupid riddles that neither you nor anyone else can make sense of. Not me, thank you. Audrey stood on the edge of the mouse gathering. She glanced at her friends enjoying themselves, but didn't feel like joining in. Twit looked across the swaying dancers and saw her faraway look. A quick grin flitted across his face. In a moment, he was standing before her, and in his paw were two small silver bells. From Master Old Nose Green Mouse Finery, he explained. I thought maybe you might like them. Oh, thank you, Twit, she exclaimed. They are lovely. Listen, the sort of sound stars should make. Master Old Nose signaled to the musicians, and they began a solemn tune. Come to the Green Mouse, ye who are ready, and receive his bounty on your destiny, he called to everyone with great ceremony. But uh, one at a time, please. He disappeared into one of the rooms, while several mice circled the area quickly and manned the curious levers and strings that surrounded the chambers. Arthur stepped into the first room, grinning nervously. Inside, it had been decorated to represent the bleak winter months and the hardship they brought. Grim, grotesque masks hung from the ceiling. Mournful paper ghosts flapped noisily from dark corners. Streamers, invisible in the gloom, dangled down and touched him, and skeletons reared up and moaned, rattling chains. Arthur loved it. He knew that outside the mice were pulling strings, wailing down tubes and operating sticks, but when something flapped unseen past his face, he still jumped back and gasped. Then he laughed and plodded through the gnashing cardboard cat's mouth and entered the second room. This was the chamber of spring and summer. Smiling faces beamed benignly from the floor. Fresh blossom garlanded the walls and heady scents filled the air. On one side there was a large golden image of the sun that blazed brilliantly. A stern voice called to him. Master Arthur Brown, why have ye come? Arthur gave the correct reply. To receive that which is now mine by right and to call down upon me my destiny. Be it great or small, tall and dangerous, meek and futile. Well, let it be as the green mouse wills it. Then roll away the sun. Arthur stepped up to the golden picture of the sun and rolled it to one side. Beyond stood Master Old Nose, resplendent in the Green Mouse costume. Take it, Arthur, he said, holding out a black bag. Arthur closed his eyes and picked out the first brass he touched. When he opened his eyes, he gasped in surprise. Why, it's like my father's, he said, please. Audrey admired her brother's mouse brass and once again wondered what hers would be. Eagerly, she entered the first room. As her eyes grew accustomed to the dismal light, she could see the masks painted with evil faces all around her. A faint wind seemed to be stirring them, and as she looked, their eyes turned to her. There, yeah, she heard a laugh. Audrey knew that there were mice outside having fun working the strings and rods, but that laugh was unlike any voice that she'd ever known. It was thin and sneering. For some time she stood by the entrance, unwilling to go any further. This is ridiculous, she told herself. Something is very wrong in here. A strange, cold, blue light rose around her. What was happening? The masks seemed to hang lower now. The faces almost animated. Yes. They were moving in horrid scowls and greedy twists, their mouths writhing. She could feel the breath from them beating upon her face. Stop it, she wailed, and waved her arms madly. Something touched her. The streamers that Arthur had felt were twig-like hands to Audrey. They clawed at her hair, raking her head with their sharp nails. 
Little figures darted in and out of the shadows, starved creatures which pinched her painfully when they ran past. A cold wind was blowing incessantly now. Winter was howling in. It battered and gripped her with a malevolent chill until she shivered and trembled. Go back, the voices in the gale called. Return, the mouths hissed. Audrey would not listen. She had seen countless eyes watching her from the darkness, eyes that were hungry. She was their prey. Audrey ran. Ahead was the entrance to the chamber of summer. She flung herself through the doorway. Sobbing, Audrey rubbed the bruises on her arms and legs. Then she became aware of warmth. The cold had gone, and new life seemed to wake in her. All around, Audrey sensed growth. Green things were sprouting. She felt the joy of unfurling leaves, stretching themselves and reveling in their newness. Buds swelled and burst, exploding into rainbows of blossom, cherry, orange, apple. Their sweet scent filled the air. Audrey was astonished. Everywhere glowed green like the sun through the leaves. Blossoms fell in a snowstorm of multicolors, and fruit took its place, expanding and growing quickly. Apples puffed up and shone red and green. Pears filled out sensually and hung heavy and ponderous on the branches. Audrey could see whole fields of grain rippling like strange yellow seas. Was she dreaming? How could this be happening? Mistress Audrey Brown, why have ye come? To receive that which is now mine by right and to call down upon me my destiny. Be it great or small, tall and dangerous, meek and futile. Let it be as the green mouse wills it. Then roll away the sun. Audrey touched the blazing image. It was not hot, but seemed to be of the purest gold, burnished like a mirror. Gently she pushed, and the sun rolled to one side. There stood Master Old Nose, his face a picture of bewilderment. He stared beyond Audrey at the living green landscape, and his mouth fell open. He tried to speak, but all that came out was a strangled squeak. He looked down at Audrey, disbelief all over his stricken face. And then he changed. Suddenly he wasn't there. Only the leafy costume remained, and that began to writhe and grow as if life gripped it. The costume sent out branches and blossomed. Audrey stepped back as it grew. It had a light of its own rising in the sap, glowing, feeling the leaves until they shone like lamps and the blossoms as wheels of spinning fire. Then two eyes formed above her, and smokily a face manifested around them. It was old and fierce, kind and noble. Upon the brow was a crown of leaves and wheat. It was the green mouse. Audrey fell to her knees before the majestic figure, unable to take her eyes from his. The mass of growing greenery was on his coat, and it moved with him, shimmering with the light of life. The blossoms fell in fiery rain, and strange fruits took their place. At first they were small and round, but as they opened and swelled they became all manner of different shapes. All were yellow. They were mouse brasses. Audrey gasped, and the face smiled at her. A green hand appeared from the coat and plucked a brass from the leaves. Take it, Audrey, said the green mouse. Half afraid, she raised her paw to take the gift, but withdrew as she saw it glitter magically. I dare not, she whispered. On my life, I dare not take it. She felt an arm close comfortingly around her shoulders. Do not be afraid, Audrey, my love. She jumped up and looked round. That was her father's voice. Where are you? she cried, taking a step back. But an invisible arm guided her gently back to the green mouse. Take it and wear it always, Albert's voice told her. But father, I can't see you. Where have you been? The mouse brass, Audrey. When can I see you? Albert's voice grew faint. I promise you will see me before the end, my darling child. Now the green mouse is waiting. 
Audrey looked into the eyes of the green mouse once more and took the mouse brass. That's funny, said Master Old Nose. I don't remember putting one of those in the bag. Audrey stared at him. The green mouse, the light, everything had gone, and all was normal. Sorry, she managed at last. Your cat charm. Don't remember that, n? Audrey looked at the mouse brass in her paw. It resembled a cat's face with narrow eyes and whiskers. Confused, she turned around. But my father was here with the green mouse. Master Old Nose tried to calm her down. No, no. It's all the excitement of the day last year. Algie Coldfoot thought he saw a pink rats jumping the moon. Now go and show your mum what you've got. Oh, and send in the next one. So Audrey left the chambers, positive that her father was alive somewhere. But how could she find him? Oh, that is lovely, darling," said her mother when she saw the mouse brass gleaming round her neck. Oh yes, the antique cat charm," joined in Mrs. Chitter. "Haven't seen one of those for a long time." Mrs. Chitter said, "Audrey, what were you saying before about Madame Akikuyu?" Well, now, if she isn't the best fortune teller around these days, knows all sorts of things, uses cards or the crystal, whatever you prefer. Where do you think she'll be now? Audrey tried to sound as casual as she could. Ah,、oh, child, there you have me. She was in the garden last night, but by now she's probably taking a shortcut to her next venue through the sewers, beyond the grill. Mrs. Chitter nodded wisely. Yes, on the other side. Where none here dares to venture, I'm afraid. The moon was high when Audrey slipped out of bed. Carefully she dressed, anxious not to wake Arthur. In the moonlight, the silver bells looked like small blue globes. Audrey slipped them onto the end of her tail and moved silently out of the skirtings. Come on, she told herself. That fortune teller's the only hope I have of finding father. At this, she bit her lip and went down into the cellar. The cellar was strewn with large wooden crates, weird objects, and rolls of musty-smelling paper. Around the far wall, a space had been cleared. Audrey stared at it in silence, gaping like an open mouth. Was the grill? Madame Akikuyu was a large black rat, a traveller trading anything for anything. She had voyaged from Morocco on a cargo ship when she was a very young rat maiden, and now she wandered around dealing in potions. A tattooed face adorned her right ear, and a red shawl with white spots covered her shoulders. She took out her pot and filled it with sewer water. Then she heaved the pot onto one of the pipes that ran along the ledge. With her knife, she poked the pipe until a vapor hissed from the puncture. Humming softly, she struck two stones together, and the sparks ignited a blue flame. As she waited for the water to boil, she hunted in her bags for leaves and powders. Trildo, she said, examining a peculiar dried object, and threw it into the pot. Audrey saw a blue flickering glow ahead. The source of the glow was around the next corner. She had no idea what it might be. Was it Jupiter? In all the stories she'd heard, he could breathe fire. Do not fear me, a loud voice called. Audrey jumped in surprise. Come around and let me see you, Mouselet. Is that Madame Akikuyu? Audrey stammered. Ah, a girl, Mouseling. How daringly brave you are! How. Desperate, your need must be. Audrey peered around the corner. Madame Akikuyu stood behind the bubbling pot. The light from the fire flickered and danced over her, and through the haze and smoke she seemed to shimmer. I am Akikuyu, she said. You have journeyed here through peril to see me. Why, yes, said Audrey. How did you know? I am Akikuyu, the rat repeated. I know many of the secrets the future withholds from others. I want to find my father. I don't know where he is. 
Not so fast, Miss Mouselet. Akikuyu needs payment to pierce the shadows. I have nothing, Audrey replied. Madam Akikuyu came forward and touched the mouse brass. Pretty dangler. Do nicely for Akikuyu. Keep cats away, yes? Audrey stepped back. I can't give you that, she said. I must wear it always. Ah! snorted the rat. Must pay, or Papa stay put. Audrey's heart sank. This was her only hope when she could feel it slipping away. Madame Akikuyu interrupted her thoughts. What are those dingle-dangles? She pointed at the silver bells. Slowly, Audrey took them from her tail and sadly handed them over. Madame Akikuyu snatched them greedily and buried them in one of her bags. She turned back to Audrey. Now come, Akikuyu show mousling many things. She brought out a pack of yellowing cards. Sit down here, mouselet. She tapped the floor next to her. Audrey approached, but sat opposite. The fortune teller scanned the cards. Dark things surround you, my mouselet, if you continue your searches. She eyed Audrey's lace and ribbons. Your mamma care for you? Yes, she does. I don't think she knows you here. Right now she worried long with your brothers and sisters. I have no sisters, Audrey said. She strained to see the crude drawings and mysterious symbols on the cards. Hmm, Rat resumed. The cards tell me much. About my father? Patience, Mouselet. Your papa long way off needs time to find. Ah, I see a boy for you. I only want my father. Akikuyu coughed and put down the cards. She had lost interest in this pestering mouse. She would tell her some story to get rid of her. I get the crystal. Nothing is hidden from Akikuyu when she crystal gazes. The rat searched in the largest bag and brought out a glass globe. Audrey looked on in admiration. The swirl of colors in the middle suggested all kinds of strange powers. Madame Akikuyu placed the crystal on a special plinth hauled from another bag and stroked the cold, smooth surface with her claws. I look into the crystal, she said. Reveal the secrets of unknown places to me, O oh crystal. Madame Akikuyu threw a quick glance at Audrey, who was staring breathlessly into the globe. Then she resumed her act. She blinked and was about to invent something when she gasped. The colors in the glass were moving, dancing in rainbow flames. Flickering shapes darted around the globe until they formed strange patterns, and then pictures. There was the altar of Jupiter, the candles burning high, and two fiery eyes blazing from the black portal. Before them, a vast army of rats bowed down. Then Akikuyu saw the army marching, for there was war, and the globe filled with blood. The rats filled her view, fighting, murdering, and plundering. Then suddenly, in the heart of the crystal, something shone, a bright, clear light stabbing through the other vile images. It was Audrey's mouse brass, and she was following it. The rats became obscured by her, trampled under her small pink feet. The globe fell into night. Unnatural things walked under the stars and spread fear over the earth. And suddenly there was a fire, raging, all-consuming flame scorched the inside of the crystal and seemed to leap out at Akikuyu, blinding her. The rat staggered back as if hit by an unseen blow. Did you see, child? Did you see? No. What happened? Was it my father? Akikuyu breathed thickly for a time. Never before had she experienced true clairvoyance. Eventually, she croaked, Your father is dead. Audrey shook her head defiantly. It's not true. You're lying. You can't see the future. I have no sisters and my father isn't dead. She turned and ran. Madame Akikuyu let her go. Her visions had startled her. What was she to do? 
Was this to herald a new time for her? She turned back to the crystal and looked at it suspiciously. She poked it tentatively, as if it were a sleeping snake. It didn't move. She took it in her claws and gazed into it. All was dark. No matter how she tried, no more visions came. Slowly, Akikuyu raised her eyes from the globe. Perhaps it had something to do with that mouse. Audrey had run a long way. Her heart thumping and her body racked with sobs, she had to stop. She leant against the brick wall and suddenly realized the noise she was making. She covered her mouth with her paw to muffle the sound. But it was too late. Someone or something was coming. Whatever it was, it was getting nearer. Perhaps it would pass her by without seeing her. Lowering her eyes, she saw that below the ledge on which she stood was another. Perhaps she could jump down. It didn't look too far. She dashed out of the shadow, elbowed past the approaching figure, and jumped over the edge. Oh! Piccadilly let out a howl of fright. He had been walking with his head down, keeping a lookout for slippery patches, when without warning he received a sharp dig in the stomach from something rushing by him. Turning quickly, he was just in time to see Audrey disappear. He dragged himself to the edge and called out, Oi! What do you think you're doing? Turning, Audrey saw the young mouse looking down at her. That hurt, you know, Piccadilly said. He put out his paw to help Audrey back up. Thanks, she said, when she stood on the top ledge again. What are you doing here, anyway? Trying to get out, and don't talk so loudly. Audrey had never seen a grey before. Where are you from? she asked. The city. I'm Piccadilly, by the way. Audrey Brown, she smiled. Piccadilly's face fell. If you're Audrey Brown, then I suppose this belongs to you, he said, and took a mouse brass from his belt. Where did you get it? It's my father's. Albert told me to give it to Gwenny. He gave it to me just before... before he was captured. I'm so sorry, Audrey. I think your father's... No, he isn't. The rats took him and you ran away, didn't you? You turned tail when he needed your help. That isn't true. It's not how it happened at all. Audrey glared at him. I hate you. You're a coward. You left my father with the rats when he's not dead. I heard him yesterday afternoon. Yesterday? But that isn't possible. Look. I don't know why you're saying these things. But we're going to go back to the skirtings and we'll see what my mother thinks of your lies. She set off along the ledge. Piccadilly ran after her. Why don't you listen? Albert was taken because he overheard Jupiter's plans. I only just got away. I don't believe you. On the ledge below, Madame Akikuyu listened with interest. She was sure the lord of the sewers would be grateful to know the whereabouts of this mouse. She smiled widely and licked her long yellow teeth. Deep in the sewers, Madame Akikuyu crept along a ledge towards the altar of Jupiter. She was about to call to the god when Morgan sprang out behind her. What do you want here, Ag? Akikuyu sniffed at him. I come to speak with the Great One, not you, Stumpo. No one talks to him except me. Now go on, you old baggage. A great rumbling interrupted him. From the portal above, two fiery points blazed out of the shadows. The piebald rat fell on his face. Oh, great glory! Why have you disturbed my rest? thundered Jupiter. Oh, Lord of all, began Madame Akikuyu, this day I have seen in my crystal things which I cannot pretend to understand. Shot it, Trollop! squawked Morgan. The flaming eyes burned brighter. Leave us, Morgan, Jupiter said. But my lord, oh, prince of the dying, the voice from the dark growled at him. And Morgan left the altar quickly, swinging his stumpy tail after him. And now, Ekikuyu, 
Jupiter continued. Tell me all. Madame Akikuyu swallowed hard and told everything she had seen in the crystal. The empire of rats with Jupiter at their head dominating the world. The young mouse girl with a shining ornament. And then the overheard conversation with Piccadilly. Finally, Jupiter spoke. Akikuyu, I believe all you saw will come to pass. But these mice must be removed. Can I trust you with the task? Yes. I know Fluffit like Master No-Tail. <laughs> Excellent. Yet I sense there is more you would ask of me. She bowed once more. You are wise, Great One. She took from her bag the crystal. This do I offer you... For your service, my lord, only today was I allowed to use it properly. How much more would I like never to need it again? Jupiter laughed. A horrible, high, jarring sound. <laughs> so that's it. You seek some of my magic. Even now, I feel the lust for it in your blood. Yes. I accept your crystal, but only when you deliver unto me the girl Audrey and Piccadilly shall I invest you with some of the black powers. Akikuyu stood back and bowed. As you have willed, so shall it be, she said. And that's the end of side one. Arthur turned over. The early morning rays of the sun were slanting in across his bed. He stretched and scratched, then looked over to Audrey's empty bed. It was unusual for his sister to be up before him. Arthur wondered where she was. Leaving their room, he made his way out of the skirtings. Oswald and Twit were in the hall. "'Morning, Arthur,' greeted Oswald. "'Isn't it a glorious day?' Cousin Twit thinks he might venture outside today, and I might go with him. Have you seen Audrey this morning? Arthur asked them. They shook their heads. Maybe she has gone outside herself, suggested Twit. Perhaps we should look for her there. Arthur didn't really expect his sister to be outside, but hunting for her was a good excuse to explore with his friends. So through the passage they went, happily scaring each other in the dark, and then they were outside. Instinctively, they dashed for cover and ran into the tall grass. Oswald was panting heavily and shielded his eyes from the sun with the scarf his mother had made him wear. You know, Arthur said after a time, there is a place we haven't looked, in the cellar. Twit was interested. He had heard all the stories of the grill from the elders and recalled how they would shiver in their skins when they told stories of it. Oh yes, let's go, it'll be good. But Oswald was worried. Nobody go down there. Arthur, don't. <gasps> but Arthur's mind was made up and Twit was eager. Oswald trailed behind them, putting forward well-reasoned arguments, but they didn't listen. They gathered some stout sticks just in case. The cellar was cluttered with tall wooden rods and large crates, but there was no sign of Audrey. Gradually, the grill gathered the other two before it. "'Tis a remarkable thing, to be sure,' remarked Twit. They all sensed the grandeur and menace of it, and without another word they stepped through the grill and were swallowed by the darkness. They progressed for some time, clutching their sticks and cautiously looking from side to side, trying to remember the way back. All they heard were echoes and the rush of the sewer water, there was no sign of Audrey. Shall we call for her? suggested Arthur. Please don't, Oswald replied. Think of all the dark, nasty, slimy things that will come out at us, out of the walls. Nasty, slithery horrors. But Twit cupped his mouth in his paws and called out, Audrey! as loud as his little voice would go. The call echoed along the tunnels, distorting strangely as it went. Immediately, there was a howling and a whooping. Out of the darkness, a pack of three rats came rushing towards them. Run! 
cried Arthur. The mice bolted along the sewer ledge, half running, half slipping. Oswald kept letting out little squeals of fright. Twit looked back. The rats were gaining. He had never seen anything so dreadful in his life. The rats were large and ugly. One had a patch over one eye and clenched a sharp steel point in his claw. Another gnashed his broken yellow teeth. But the last had one of his claws missing, and in its place bound tightly to the stump was something that made the field mouse squeal like his cousin, a peeler. Arthur realized that they would never be able to outrun them. We've got to turn and fight, he called to the others. What? How? squeaked Oswald. Use your sticks. So when the mice reached the corner in the tunnel, they turned and faced their enemy, brandishing their sticks as menacingly as they could. But where were their pursuers? Maybe they've gone, suggested Oswald. There was a loud laugh, and the rat with the eye patch leapt onto a brick behind them. He waved the sharp steel over his hideous head. Arthur swung his stick, but the other was too quick, dodging here and there, whilst the mouse tried in vain to hit him. Then the rat struck out. He jabbed Arthur in the arm and then cut his ear. The mouse gritted his teeth and winced at the pain. Twit was having problems of his own. Over the side of the ledge, a claw had appeared, followed by a great ugly rat head. The field mouse raised his stick, then dropped it as the rat brought his other arm over the edge, revealing the peeler. Twit shrank back against the wall. Oswald had nowhere to run. The three friends were cornered, trapped with a rat on every side, and the wall at their backs. The mice knew that this was it. What a catch, said Skinner. Let's make a bloody bones of them. Beat Dickon any day, cackled one-eyed Jake. The mice could hear the juices stirring the rats' bellies into action, squelching and gurgling horribly inside their dirty skins. Suddenly all was confusion. Skinner was knocked off the ledge and sent spinning into the water below. Something leapt onto Jake's back and bit deeply into one of his ears so that he cried out and dropped the steel point. The three friends stood amazed as a strange grey mouse picked up the weapon and charged after the rat with the broken teeth who turned and fled. At the same time, Audrey, for it was she, clung on to Jake's neck and gripped his ear with her teeth until he too ran. She sauntered back, wiping her mouth. Ugh, she said. Rat tastes horrid. Come on, urged Piccadilly. Let's go while they're still surprised. There was no time for talk, no time to explain. Arthur had a score of questions to ask. What was Audrey doing down here, and who was this grey mouse? He had to wait until they were all in the cellar once more before he began. Audrey fended him off firmly. Look, Arthur, I went to find Father. No one else seemed bothered. Oh, look, Audrey, sighed Arthur, shaking his head sadly. You've got to realise, once and for all, the Father must be dead. Audrey turned cold. This is Piccadilly. You'd better hear what he has to say, she said. Piccadilly felt awkward. Do you think I could see uh, Mrs. Brown, please? <clears throat> he said. I really don't think I could say this twice. Arthur agreed that it could wait and suggested they dust themselves down before they left the cellar. It was while Audrey was straightening her collar that she noticed something was wrong. Her mouse brass was not around her neck. She had lost it. In the sewers. A tense group gathered in front of Mrs. Brown. Audrey said, Mother, this is Piccadilly. He has something to say. Piccadilly cleared his throat and began. Gwen Brown listened patiently, and Audrey watched as her mother serenely accepted it all, her eyes dry, her face calm. When Piccadilly finished, he handed over Albert's mouse brass. And the last thing I heard him say was <clears throat> that he loved you, he added, finally. Arthur covered his eyes with his paws. Well, I don't believe him, Audrey said. It's obvious he ran away when father needed him. Gwen clutched the mouse brass next to her heart. Audrey, she said, it's over. And I want you to promise you and Arthur that you will never, ever go into the sewers again. Audrey knew that her tone meant no nonsense, and she made the promise. Then she remembered her own mouse brass and crumbled inside. How was she to get it back? Later that evening, 
Audrey found Twit and Oswald in the hall. They asked after her mother. Oh, she's fine, she replied. Only, it's my mouse brass. It must have come off in the fighting. And I can't go back down there. I had to promise mother. What am I to do? Twit looked up at her and said timidly, I'll go back in there for you. Oh, would you? Oswald knew that he couldn't refuse. He gulped loudly. Ah, if Twit goes, then I ought to go as well, he said. Besides, I'm the only one who can find it, aren't I? They all knew what he meant. Oswald's albino blood made him sensitive to lost objects. He had a divining rod shaped like a spindly catapult, and with it he had found many things believed lost forever. They crossed to the cellar door and were about to pass through when Piccadilly surprised them. Hello, Audrey, he said. Where are you going? It's her mouse brass, said Twit. Got lost in the scufflin'. It did. Piccadilly didn't like it. Please, Audrey, don't go. I'm not going. I made that promise to Mother. Twit and Oswald are going. They're not afraid. Oswald wasn't so sure about that, but the accusation stung Piccadilly. The grey mouse struggled with his fears. He remembered vividly the altar chamber and could never forget Albert's last cries. There truly had been nothing he could have done, yet he felt that he should have tried. All right, he said. I'll go, instead of Oswald. But I've got to go, said Oswald miserably. We won't find it without dousing for it. Then instead of twit, said Piccadilly. Now don't argue. Ain't no point three of us going, when two will do. Reluctantly, twit agreed, and they descended the cellar steps. At the grill they stopped for a moment. Audrey hesitated. She felt wretched making them do this for her. I'll stay here and wait for you she said. Oh, my, was all Oswald could manage as he wriggled through the gap. Twit and Audrey were left alone in the cellar. In the sewers, Oswald held his divining rod in outstretched arms. Does that work? asked Piccadilly. Oh, yes, yeah. every time. They set off, Oswald leading the way, the rod giving an occasional twitch. Audrey waited anxiously in the cellar with Twit. So preoccupied were they in their thoughts that they didn't sense the change of air flowing from the grill or detect the muffled movements of body against body on the other side. A voice called Audrey's name in the hall. It was Arthur looking for her. Can you fetch him, Twit? she said. I said I'd wait for them here. Twit got to his feet and climbed over the rolls of paper till he reached the cellar steps. When he reached the top step, he looked down at Audrey sitting next to the gap and then squeezed through the door. Arthur was wondering if he ought to try the landing when Twit came up to him. Oh, hello, he said. I'm looking for Audrey. Again. And that Piccadilly. She's in the cellar, said Twit. Arthur was furious. What's she doing there? Twit explained about the missing mouse brass and how Piccadilly and Oswald had gone to look for it. We really can't have this, protested Arthur. If she lost it... Then it's her own fault, and she's got no right to make Oswald and that Grey go looking for it. He strode down the hall and barged through the cellar doors. Just you listen to me, Audrey Brown, he yelled. But she wasn't there. There was no sign of Audrey anywhere. But Arthur and Twit guessed at once where she had gone. They knew nothing of the brief struggle that had taken place moments before, and how, overwhelmed and defeated, Audrey had been dragged through the grill by sharp, snatching claws. "'Should we go down after her?' suggested Twit. Arthur sat with his head in his hands. He had to decide what to do. Should they follow Audrey and break the promise to his mother? Whom should he ask for advice?' Arthur didn't believe strongly enough in the green mouse to pray to him. Audrey had gone to that rat woman, Akikuyu. But who else was there? Then he had it. The bats. Those strange creatures in the attics. They had supernatural powers. Everyone knew that. Sometimes you could ask them for advice. Twit, he announced. I'm going to visit the bats. They'll know what I should do. Twit's eyes opened wide. 
He'd never even seen a bat. They were secret animals who wrapped themselves in mystery. His whiskers quivered with excitement. Oh, yes, Arthur. I'd dearly love to go a greeting the bats. Arthur turned to him. Oh, no, I'm sorry, but they only allow one visitor up at a time. Please understand, Twit. Twit was disappointed, but knew there was nothing to be done about it. Arthur had to go alone. They climbed the cellar steps. How do you get there, Arthur? Twit asked. There's a passage under the stairs in the hall which leads to a space between two walls. There are bits of junk sticking out all over them right at the top. Easy, really, just like a ladder. All the way to the attics? That's right. By this time, the two mice were in the hall. Arthur crossed to the stairs. The opening's in here somewhere, he said, lifting a corner of the carpet. The hole was obscured by webs and fluff. In disgust, he cleared them away, sending spiders scampering back to the shadows. As he prepared to lower himself, he took Twit's paw. I'll be as quick as I can, I promise, and then we'll know what to do. I'm sorry you have to stay here. He gave the small paw a last squeeze and was gone. Poor Twit. He felt so lonely. Everyone had gone. First Oswald and Piccadilly, then Audrey, and now Arthur. He wondered if he would ever see any of them again. Suddenly, with a resolution foreign to him, Twit scrambled to his feet. To follow Arthur without him knowing was the plan. With a bit of luck, he might be able to overhear what was being said with the bats. He swung his short legs over the side of the hole and dropped down. The dust flew as he landed with a bump. Great choking clouds of it billowed out, and spiders, annoyed at this second disturbance, ran to protect their eggs. Arthur heaved himself up one more level. He was nearing the eaves now. What a climb it had been. His arms ached madly. He rested for a moment and rubbed life into his muscles. Two more clambers would do it. Already he could see the opening to the attics. When he reached it, he lay on his back and stroked the beam beneath him thankfully. He tried not to think how difficult it would be to get down again. There was an unusual calm in the attics. Arthur picked his way round under the rafters, hopping from beam to beam. What an odd place it was with the sloping beams and lofty ceiling. This part of the attic looked like a great hall of kings. High and magnificent, the rafters soared into the darkness above. Yet there was one lying broken and askew. Arthur stared up at it. The roof had been broken in the rafters' ruin, and through the open space he could see a cluster of stars in the midnight sky. A dark shape on the rafters stirred unexpectedly. It shifted its position, then settled down again. Arthur gasped. It was a bat. The mysterious creature was perched high on the rafter, so that Arthur had to tilt his head right the way back to see him. The bat's head was hidden in his great folded wings. Only two pointed ears could be seen behind them. Arthur gave a slight, polite cough. <clears throat> there was a dry rustle as the bat raised his head. The light of the stars came down to rest on the bat's brow in an aura of knowledge and wisdom. Haughtily, the bat gazed down from the rafter and scrutinized the mouse keenly. Arthur fidgeted in embarrassment. I am Eldritch, declared the bat. You are late, Master Brown. Arthur apologized, uncomfortable at being expected. Then he said, I'm here for a purpose, O oh Eldritch. The bat stretched and yawned. He unfurled his wings, then, in a mocking, mellifluous tone, said mysteriously, I see a mouse young and fair, her brass is lost and so is she, ribbons and lace adorn her. Well, that's Audrey, my sister, cried Arthur. Where is she? Eldridge glared at him for interrupting, and then continued, Ribbons and lace adorn her, but into heathen darkness she is dragged. With brutal partners shall she dance. From bloody temples and through the ash of the dead does her fate lead her. Eldridge stared at Arthur for a moment and then whispered, Only the spinning, shining circle can save her from the fiend below. The bat paused, 
and looked into the heavens. Off your approaches, he said. Arthur stood at the edge of a starlit area, wondering what the bat had been rambling on about. Suddenly, a shadow flitted outside, cutting off the starlight. A second bat entered silently through the hole and alighted next to the first. Salutations, Orpheo, greeted Eldritch. Hail, Eldritch, the newcomer returned. Is this the company we sought? Eldritch yawned and replied in a bored, dry tone. It is the one, but not the other. Then our time is wasting here. You, Master Brown, Orpheo rapped out sharply. You would seek counsel of us, my brother and I. Well, listen, and you may have your fill for an age and more when we are done. Arthur clasped his paws together, fearing what they would say. Eldritch began. Threefold the life threats. How shall he be vanquished? By water deep, fire blazing, and the unknown path. Remember, Brown Mouse, pain and sorrow stalk the summer fields in straw-clad forms. When noon is hot and corn is gold, beware the ear that whispers and shun the darkness. Through fire, into fire, break not the sphere and let the demon out. Eldritch raised his skin-webbed wings, and gathered them about his face until he was a crouched, cowled figure, and said no more. Then Orpheo began. Look to the mouse with bells on her tail, she who made the doll. Through ice and blizzard will hail great doom. However sweet the bell may sound, stray not into the fog, for bitter spears shall rain. Who is the mouse without the brass? What silver shall she wear if all survive the dark months? Orpheo closed his eyes of jet. They had both finished with Arthur. Depart, Master Brown, they said as one. Arthur shook himself. He thanked the bats courteously and bade them farewell. Slowly, he walked back to the eaves, trying to piece together the ridiculous bat advice. What a load of twaddle, he thought. From a dark corner, Twit emerged. He had lain hidden for a short while, afraid to interrupt the bat's discourse. Now Arthur had left, Twit was unsure what to do. He knew he should follow his friend. But Eldridge and Orpheo had greatly impressed the little field mouse. From his corner, he watched them and then brought himself up sharply. They were watching him. The field mouse gulped. <coughs> Come forward, witch husband, demanded Orpheo. Eldritch stirred in his wing cocoon. Step out, friend of the trapped mouse, he said. Twit meekly shambled towards them. I'd be sorry if I offended thee by lurking there, he ventured to say. The Bat Brothers looked at each other with an odd smirk on their faces. Into the light, childless one, they encouraged. Twit obeyed, entering the circle of starlight. He looked up at them, perched high above. Noble Mouse! Ha 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 ha! laughed Orpheo. Eldritch tossed his head and said darkly, When troubles stir and passions rouse, whose paw will you take to save all? And when your bride returns home, why are you not by her side? Beg your pardon, but I ain't got no wife, Twit informed them. This is he, this is the one, cried Orpheo delightedly. The simpleton, the cheeseless mouse, he gurgled with amusement. Ho, ho, ho! Then they drew themselves up to their full height and dived off the rafter. For a moment they flew over Twit's head, and then they flitted down to him, seeming very grave and serious. They pressed about him closely and put their open wings about him. Hear not the scorn of other, not many are as brave and true. When horror stalks your field, you shall win through. Despair not in the long, lonely years. They hugged Twit tightly as if trying to console him 
for some hurt that was yet to come. The field mouse struggled, embarrassed by their embraces. Now what are you a blathering about, he asked. I can scarce breathe with you so tight around me. He disentangled himself from the two brothers and gasped for breath. He needs air, declared Orfeo. Fresh air, cooed Eldritch, and that strange smirk lit his furred, fox-like face. We shall give you air, cried Orfeo gleefully. Just hold up your paws. Twit reached up. The bats began to flap their wings and rose elegantly upwards. They each gripped a tiny pink paw in their feet, and up went Twit, exclaiming in wild delight. Hold tight, shouted Orfeo. With graceful and easy movements, the bats carried Twit higher and higher until they were out of the hole in the roof and into the night air. Twit dangled beneath the two bats as they flew up into the darkness. The night air streamed through his fur, making him wriggle with delight. It was a wonderful sensation to feel nothing under his feet and his tail hanging in empty space. Beneath them lay a glittering sea of light. The great city of London sprawled magnificently in all directions. An incomparable, matchless, slumbering creature bejeweled and dangerous. The bats wheeled in circles, <laughs> chuckling at one another. Detford passed below them, the cramped estates, the old buildings with grimy windows and sagging lintels. Twit saw the shimmering ribbon of the Thames on their left snaking around the docks. What's that down there? he asked as they passed over an unfamiliar object. A ship to sail the high seas, answered Eldritch. Before Twit had time to consider the strange spiky thing, it had been left behind. They swept along over beautiful white buildings, their many windows and pillars reflected in the calm river. Soon Twit saw a wide parkland drawing near. Within it was a green hill crowned by bulbous buildings and ancient trees. And what are they? he asked. The bats flew around the observatories of Greenwich and swooped low over the domes. This is where the stars are studied, said Orfeo. They search for answers far out into the deep heavens, whilst below the star wife knows all. Not far off lay Blackheath, and the field mouse could see the vast expanse of flat grassland. But his companions refused to go any further. Back, they cried. We must return. Actually, Twit was glad. He was awfully cold, for the wind bit right through his fur. They made haste and veered away from the hill. This has been splendid, he thanked them. Orfeo looked at him, oddly, with that strange smirk on his face. I tire, he said. Who would have thought that a small mouse would weigh so. Eldritch agreed. This burden wearies me also. Shall we release him? Twit heard them and trembled. Don't drop me, he squeaked. I'll smash to bits. Oh, where shall we deposit our baggage? sang Orfeo. He belongs in the fields. Put him in a nest. They circled round the old ship they had passed earlier. It was the Cutty Sark. Under the fierce face of the figurehead they darted and then spiralled upwards through the rigging, flitting around the mainmast until they reached its topmost point. Then they let go of the field mouse and flapped off, laughing. Ha, 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 ha! Twit fell. For a moment he was wriggling wildly in midair, the ground rushing towards him. This is it, he thought. Then a gasp was thumped out of him as he hit the mainmast. He was winded, but still managed to cling on to the timber. The Cutty Sark has no sails to adorn her three masts, and in the moonlight she was a stark, ghostly memory of what she had been. Her rigging was like a dark web spun by a vast black spider. Twit lay on the mast, struggling for breath, clinging to the ropes for dear life. 
Finally, his breathing eased, and he dared to look down. He was teetering on the brink of destruction. He knew that he had to get down somehow. He thought about it carefully, collecting his thoughts slowly. Perhaps he could shin down the mast, but it was so sheer and wide that this idea didn't appeal. In the end, he decided to climb down in stages, crisscrossing the rigging. He could pretend the ropes were just long barley stalks. With even his small weight, the rope swayed and bobbed about. But Twit was an expert and deftly managed the feat. Soon he was on the next level and began again on another rope. It wasn't long before he stood on the deck of the ship. He ran gladly to the side, happy to have something solid beneath his feet at last, and peered over. The cutty sark was in a long concrete trough, supported underneath and around the sides by many iron struts. Twit could see no way of leaping from the deck to the edge of the concrete. From a hole in the side, a great chain issued and fell to the ground where an anchor was attached and rested on the trough floor. He wondered if he could scale down the hull of the ship and reach that chain. Twit swung himself over the edge. Luckily, there was a decorative panel immediately beneath which carried the ship's name in gold relief. His small pink feet could get a purchase on it. He grabbed the sea and worked his way down. It was a long way. His progress was slow even with footholds. He pressed himself close to the gilt where it ended in a flourish of curling fronds. On his left was the hole where the chain left the ship, but a metal ridge across his path prevented him from reaching it. The chain was just too far away. He leant over as far as he could and groped into the hole. Ahoy! shouted a deep voice. Twit looked around but could see no one. Ahoy there! In here! it called again. The voice seemed to be coming from inside the hole. Twit blinked and stared. Two eyes approached. You're in a spot, matey! A thick, strong paw emerged from the dark. Take this, Melado. The voice sounded friendly enough, yet there was a tone in it that commanded attention and obedience. Twit reached out and clasped the offered paw tightly. Now you jump and I'll pull. Twit jumped, and the strong arm tugged fiercely. Before he knew anything, Twit was in the shadows next to the owner of the voice. Not too bad, were it? Now, let's get away from this dark place. The creature pattered away, and Twit followed obediently. Only when they emerged from the darkness and stepped out into the dimly lit lower deck could he see the stranger properly for the first time. He was a mouse of middle age, with white whiskers framing a round face. His eyes were bright and wise. He was stout, but could obviously move with speed when required, and he looked very strong. There seemed to be an air of something foreign about him, as if he had been to far-off countries and adopted some of their habits. This effect was emphasized by a red kerchief round his neck and a shapeless navy blue woolen hat on his head. Well, the stranger said, turning to Twit at last, welcome aboard, matey. He stretched out his paw. Midship mouse Thomas Triton. Ha <laughs> ha! Twit took the paw in his and shook it vigorously. Willem scuttle. But most ways I'm called Twit. Hmm, well, lad, you've a look of one of them who's got a tale to tell. Come with me back to my bunkhouse. I bunk in the hold. We'll have a sip of something to warm you and me down to the toes. The hold was long and high, sloping gently and curving round at each end. In the gloom, Twit could just make out a row of giant figures on both sides of him. All were staring fixedly ahead. Twit hesitated. I ain't a going in there, he said. Them gert forms are staring with big round googly eyes. Thomas laughed. Ha ha, it's all right, matey. They're only figureheads carved from wood. Friendly enough, matter of fact, I live in one of them. Ha 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 ha. 
Thomas led him to a figurehead that was somewhat smaller than its neighbours. It was the image of a maiden painted a glossy white with a turban of gold on her head. This is my princess, he said. Now up you go, matey, round the back with you. <laughs> Twit peered behind the carving. There was a rich smell of fresh paint close to her, and there where the two joints didn't quite meet was a small hole. The field mouse passed easily through the hole and into a comfortable room. A stubby white candle flickered gently, lending the room a warm, cosy glow. In one corner was a bed, and here and there, neatly arranged, were Thomas's few belongings. A tiny wooden ship, a lead anchor charm, some pictures of distant lands and maps of continents, and a highly polished sword. Thomas bade him sit down. Twit found a block of wood and sat on it. The midship mouse strolled over to the corner and brought out two deep bowls. He gave one to Twit and filled it with a strange-smelling liquid. That's rum, lad. Ha <laughs> ha! Grinned Thomas. A good belly warmer to get you going now. What were you a doing outside? For a moment, Twit collected his wits. Then he took a deep breath and began telling of Audrey's first disappearance and the search for her in the sewers, the fight with the rats, how Oswald and Piccadilly had set off to find the mouse brass. How Audrey had vanished from the cellar, and how he had followed Arthur up to the attic in search of the bats. The midship mouse puffed on his pipe and gazed abstractedly through the blue smoke that gathered around his face. Things are moving, matey. I've felt it for some time. A change in the order of things. Summit's up, or should I say down, as that's where the trouble is. He turned to Twit and said, I've been many places, matey, strange lands I've seen and stranger creatures I've met, but I ain't never come across out like the situation here. A living guard down in the sewers and a blacker fiend you won't find all around the world. Everyone's afraid of him, no exceptions. Rats, mice, even the squirrels in Greenwich Park yonder don't talk about him. The tales I hear would make your tail drop off. He's a dirty stain on the land, and he's up to summit. Thomas knocked his pipe on the shelf. Time I found out what. Come on, lad. He ushered Twit out of the figurehead. Where are we going? inquired the field mouse. We're off to the sewers, matey, and don't worry. Ha <laughs> ha! There's an easier way than the one you tried before. A sliver of pale moonlight showed ahead as the two mice emerged from the cutty sark. Just climb down this bit of rudder, Thomas explained. They managed it easily and were soon standing on the concrete. The ship reared high above them in stately grace. Thomas led Twit to the side of the concrete trench. There was a gutter in the floor and he followed it until they came to a grating in the wall. Twit stepped back in alarm. The grill? He choked. Thomas looked at him curiously. Aye, tis a grill, nothing more. But Twit shook his head. The grill leads to him, he murmured. Tis an evil door. Can you not feel the dark things lurking beyond? Wicked magic fills the air. Black thoughts come to you and hedge you up terrible. Thomas pulled his woolen hat down further. I'm not having this. I'm fed up with all this hushed whispering, not daring to say his name. Ain't no one ever seen him. And if he's horrible to look at, like they say, with two heads and such, don't bother me any things I seen. No sewer rat's going to intimidate old Tom. Come on, matey. We'll go through this gate and find something useful. He disappeared through one of the large spaces in the grating. With one last doubtful look at it, Twit followed. Inside, they trotted along the drains. Thomas was striding, determined to discover what Jupiter was up to. Behind him, Twit had to run to keep up, but he felt he would rather be down here with Tom than outside alone. The drain opened into the sewer, and they continued along the ledge. Twit gradually became aware of a distant chant. 
a monotonous dirge with many voices singing hoarsely. What can that be? he wondered. The midship mouse was uncertain. Let's find the source of this shanty, he said. The words were difficult to catch, but the mood behind them was plain. Boredom, misery, and the bitter tang of hatred. A pencil of light shone from a hole in the wall where the cement had crumbled. Voices boomed through it. Thomas put his eye to the hole. Blow me, he breathed incredulously. What are they a doing of? Twit tugged at his paw. The midship mouse lifted him up so that he too could see. Twit gasped. Before them was a tunnel, wide and high, the floor of which was a good deal below that of their own passage. It was filled with rats. Nasty, ugly rats. Sneers on their great faces and sweat pouring off their bodies. All the rats were laboring, and as they worked, they sang. It was a work song, a song to keep them in time with each other. It told of slow deaths, of throttlings, throat slittings, peelings, and roastings. Every rat had a tool of some kind in his claws, old spoons, sharp bits of metals, anything to dig with. Twit realized that the whole tunnel had been dug by them. There was an army of them, straining and striking the ground. Some were actually scrabbling at the ground with bleeding claws. Older, less useful rats wearily heaved the soil away in sacks and tins strapped to their brittle, bony backs. Twit turned to Thomas. What be they digging for? Thomas pondered. Oh, there's a reason. Jupiter's got something up his sleeve. Treasure, maybe. Or perhaps some powerful magical thing to make him stronger, green mouse forbid. He closed his eyes and turned slowly round. If my sense of direction is right, I reckon that tunnel they're digging runs clear under the park. If they keep this up, they'll be under Black Heath soon. Now I wonder what Jupiter wants there. He put his arm around Twit's shoulder. Let's get out of this dungeon and take a walk in the fresh air. I've a mind to find out what Jupiter's after. Whilst Audrey had waited with Twit in the cellars, Oswald and Piccadilly had run headlong into the sewers in search of her missing mouse brass. For some time they pattered quietly down the deserted tunnels, turning whenever the rod jerked them in a different direction. Piccadilly let Oswald lead, because the albino's eyes could see more in the dark than his. Suddenly, Oswald let out a shriek and fell over. Piccadilly was so close behind him that he too found himself sprawled on the wet ledge. What happened? he asked, stunned a little. I'm sorry, Oswald said quickly. I fell over that piece of wood. A green, damp, swollen plank lay obstinately behind them. Piccadilly forgave his friend, if only to shut him up. Oswald was a constant apologiser. But the albino mouse soon stopped again. What's <coughs> that? he whispered. A faint rumble came from in front of them. It grew steadily louder. Oh, lummy, breathed Piccadilly huskily. Rats is a-coming. He grabbed Oswald's paw and dragged him back down the sewer. Look for a hole in the wall. The mice groped frantically at the brick wall, but there was nothing, neither crack nor gap. Piccadilly glanced quickly over his shoulder. The tramp of rat feet was very close. From behind the corner came a glow. The rats were carrying torches that would reveal them wherever they hid. He looked across at Oswald, whose eyes were wider than he would have thought possible. Oswald gulped, and the divining rod fell from his hands. Piccadilly's foot brushed against something, and he looked down. It was the plank they had tripped over before. A wild idea seized him. He picked it up. Telling Oswald to do the same, he ran off the ledge. Before Oswald knew what they were doing, they had jumped clear away from the side of a sewer. Then splash! Dark water swallowed them. The rats burst around the corner. There were twenty of them, all jostling for places as they ran. 
The fiery torches were held high over their ugly heads. Their red eyes sparkled in the firelight and shone with the hunger and hatred that drove them. Leading them was a rat with a patch over one eye. It was one-eyed Jake. Piccadilly had already scrambled aboard the plank. He used his paws to paddle over to where Oswald was thrashing about. He hauled the wet albino onto the makeshift raft, where he lay collapsed like a broken doll. His coughing rocked them, and the water slopped over the edge of the wood. Piccadilly was afraid that they might sink and prayed for the rats not to hear them. He looked up. The rats were still above them. Why was that? Had they seen him and Oswald? No. The rats were still running, and then he realized with a dull, sick feeling that the current of the sewer water was carrying them along at the same pace as the rats above. Piccadilly groaned. They'd been lucky so far. No rat had bothered to look down at the stream below, but it couldn't be much longer until one did, and everyone knew that rats were excellent swimmers. Oswald's breathing eased. He had spat out as much water as he could. He turned over and lay on his back, grunting uncomfortably. I'll be ill for <gasps> weeks, he said, glumly. Piccadilly put a paw to his lips. Quiet, he whispered, and pointed upwards. Oswald slowly took in the situation. Oh, my, <laughs> he whimpered. They both gazed up at the ledge where the rats ran, mouths agape and slobbering. Oh, Jake, called one rat to the leader. What are we going to do with the mouse when we get one? Bloody bones him, cackled the others. Just you remember, lads, began Jake, that if it's a mouse wench or a grey, then you and me can't have him. There was a groan from the other rats. No fear, they cried. Suddenly, Oswald gave a strangled cry of shock. Oh, no, he gasped. They must be going to the Skirtings to find you and Audrey. You're right, said Piccadilly. Crikey, what can we do? We've got to stop them, cried Oswald, thinking of the chaos the rats would cause among the mice in the old empty house. But now, there's so many, and here we are down here. Oswald gulped. Maybe we could lure them away. Piccadilly agreed. How fast do you think you can paddle? he asked. Oh, not as fast as you, I'm sure. But we might give him a good chase for a while, anyway. All right, then, said Piccadilly. He looked up at the rats on the ledge. I suppose they might have seen us soon anyway, he thought to himself. He cupped his paws around his mouth and yelled at the top of his voice, Oi, slime stuffers! Where's your ankies to wipe your snotty noses? The rats stopped and looked around in amazement. Maggot brains! Piccadilly resumed. Feel me if you can. <laughs> the rats saw them now. There they are, they called. Two floating mouses. Wait, shouted Jake. One of them's a grey. Get him, lads. Paddle now, urged Piccadilly, and he and Oswald began pawing madly at the water on either side of the raft. Get down there, snarled Jake, and kicked a rat over the edge. Twelve others followed him, gnashing and snarling as they jumped. On the ledge, Jake watched the chase in amusement. The rat called Fletch swaggered up to him. He was a tatty, dark brown rat with big yellow pimples on his black nose. Not going in for a dip, Jake asked dryly. Fletch shook his head. Don't feel like it today, Jake. You and Water were never friends, Fletch, remarked Jake. There's plenty down there to catch those two, grunted Fletch. I thought I'd best stick with you. Where are we bound? Jake looked down to the water where the swimming rats were gaining on the little raft. There's still a skirt to catch. You lot, he called to the five remaining rats on the ledge. Leave them to it. Let's find our own mouse. The rats cheered, and Jake led them away. Through the tunnels they went until they came to the grill. To their great glee, they found there the very mouse they had been sent by Jupiter to look for. Audrey had just sent Twit to fetch Arthur. 
when Jake reached out and grabbed her from behind. And that's the end of side two. Piccadilly paddled furiously. The pursuing rats were very close now. One had a knife between his teeth. He caught up with them and scrambled onto the raft. His great claws tore at the wood, and the plank lurched dangerously in the water. Just as the ugly brute was getting his balance, Piccadilly leapt at him, and with a startled wail the rat fell back and landed on one of his comrades. There was an almighty smack, and a fountain of water spouted up around them. Piccadilly hastily resumed paddling. Ahead, he saw the end of a pipe jutting out of a sewer wall. He wondered if he and Oswald could reach it and climb inside. He called to him and signalled his plan. Oswald nodded vigorously, anything to get off the raft. They steadied themselves on the plank and stood up shakily, clutching each other's paws for safety. The pipe drew near. We won't be able to reach it, howled Oswald. It's too high. Well, then we'll just have to jump. Get ready. One, two. Oh, no, that rat's got us. He's trying to climb up again. Three. All at once... A number of things happened. Firstly, the raft passed under the pipe and Piccadilly jumped, which was fortunate for him because the rat suddenly lunged at him with his mouth wide open. But the most surprising thing came with a fierceness that stunned everyone, rats and all. With a roar of foam and spray, a great rush of water flushed out of the pipe above. The rat got a mouthful of it and was knocked off the raft into the stream, which had suddenly become a raging torrent. He sank to the murky bottom, never to resurface. The other rats were cut off by the sudden waterfall and couldn't cope with its frothing force. Piccadilly's luck held. Although he missed the pipe, he managed to land back on the raft, just as it was gripped by the new current and swept away at breakneck speed. Oswald grasped the sides for dear life. The raft was tossed around like a straw. It was a wild bounce of a ride for the two mice as they shot along. Then they shot out into a lofty, spacious tunnel. The water swirled and eddied as its force was spent. The raft slowed and twirled around calmly. Piccadilly sat up. Hooray! he shouted in relief. The ledges in this tunnel were low. Low enough to climb onto, in fact. Come on, Oswald, Piccadilly said cheerfully. Time to get off. He hauled himself up and then turned to give Oswald a helping paw. Gracelessly, Oswald scrambled up onto the ledge. Wonder where we are now, thought Piccadilly aloud. Don't ever remember this place, even when I was wandering around before I met Albert. I can see an opening in the side up ahead, said Oswald, his sharp pink eyes scanning the area in front of him. Shall we take a look? When they reached the hole, Piccadilly sniffed to check. You know, he said, I don't think this passage is used by rats very much. It whiffs strange. He frowned. What does it remind me of? Yeah, that's it. Once when I was in the city, I found some of those cringing rats with a salted fish. They didn't know what it was. They licked it and was gasping for water. Ha, 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 ha. He laughed at the memory. I don't understand, said Oswald. What's salted fish doing down here? I only said it smelt like it. Perhaps we've stumbled across someone's secret larder. rat ord most like. He gave Oswald a quick, mischievous look. Fancy a butcher's? No, I don't want to go and see dried rat food. It might be anything. I'll stay here and keep watch. So Piccadilly cautiously passed through the opening. There was a narrow passage beyond which abruptly opened out into a small chamber dug out with claws and teeth. It was filled with all sorts of rat booty. Some chocolate biscuits were still in their wrappers. A bag of sticky, fluff-covered boiled sweets lay on the floor. There was a large bundle of dark sacking or cloth in one corner, several bundles of knotted, tangled string, a tall jar with a few shriveled lumps in it and a squashy tomato, which was gradually acquiring a green fur coat. Piccadilly looked distastefully at the bizarre collection. The things rats collected. A movement behind him made him swing round suddenly. <laughs> it's only me, said Oswald. I didn't like it out there on my own. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> yuck. He looked down at his foot. I've trodden in something sticky, 
those sweets have oozed out on the floor. Oswald hopped about as he examined his tacky foot. There's some cloth or sacking over there, giggled Piccadilly. I'll get it for you to wipe that off. He clambered over the biscuits, avoiding the mouldering tomato. Oswald leaned against the wall. I suppose it could have been worse, he said. I might have stepped on that tomato thing. Oh, it's disgusting. Is that what was making that funny smell you were talking about, Piccadilly? The grey mouse was standing stock still and staring at the crumpled dark material in his paws. Oswald became concerned it wasn't like Piccadilly to be so quiet. What is it? A hint of fear crept into his voice. There was something about his friend that made him uneasy. Don't tease. Oswald, Piccadilly muttered thickly. Come see. The white mouse forgot all about the sticky substance on his foot and hurried over to see what the other had found. Piccadilly turned a drained, shocked face to him. His eyes were wet and his lashes blinked the tears away. Not knowing what to expect, Oswald fearfully looked down at what Piccadilly was holding. It was not cloth or sacking as Piccadilly had first thought. It was a mouse's skin. It had been a brown mouse with a splash of white on the breast. The ears were missing. There were holes where the eyes had been, and the paws and feet had been chewed off. Oswald began to weep. There was a mouse who disappeared when I was young. He lived on a landing, and he, they, they used to call him Bib because of a white patch on his chest. His voice broke up chokingly. There's more over there, said Piccadilly. Shh! There's somebody coming. Oswald's tear-stained face broke into a despairing picture of misery. His lips wobbled with the wail that was about to surface. Piccadilly grabbed his scarf and shook him angrily. Look, he said, if you don't want to end up like Bib, you'd best come and hide with me, and not a sound, right? But where? There isn't a place to hide in here, Oswald gibbered. Ain't there. Piccadilly pointed at the bundle of dried mouse skins. He dragged his horrified friend towards them. Morgan came tramping in. A sack was on his back. Ah! He cursed. He looked around the room. This was his own special place, somewhere to think out his own dark schemes, somewhere to hide his treasures. He dumped the sack on the floor and plonked himself down next to it. He had just been ordered by his majestic darkness to go to Black Heath, and this sack had been waiting on the altar for him to take along. Things were changing, and Morgan didn't like it. His lord was planning something, and he couldn't figure out what it was. He wondered what was in the sack. Morgan twirled something in his claws, one of Jake's party had returned, drenched and bedraggled. Apparently, the water that gushed from the pipe had drowned most of the rats who were pursuing Piccadilly and Oswald. The survivors then involved themselves in blame-laying and fighting ensued. Only one young rat had returned to the altar chamber to tell the tale and to bring this odd thing with him. Morgan threw it into the air and caught it again. It was the divining rod. He cackled. <laughs> Jake was going to get it in the neck from his highness for letting that grey escape. He licked his teeth and cast his eyes on the rest of his booty. His gaze rested on the fluffy, sticky sweets. He grasped one and flicked it into his waiting jaws. The sweets squelched and stuck between his teeth, clinging in gluey lumps. Morgan picked at them with his sharp claws amidst appreciative sucking noises. <coughs> Under the pile of mouse skins, Piccadilly and Oswald huddled together, hardly daring to breathe. It was the skins that smelt of salt. It had been rubbed well into the newly peeled flesh to preserve them. So dense was it that when Piccadilly moistened his lips, he could taste the salty tang. Oswald closed his eyes. The situation was too horrible for him. Here he was, wrapped in dead mouse flesh. It was a chilling, gruesome thing. 
The Paulus arms dangled around and touched him so softly that it was like being tickled by the dead and caressed by ghosts. Piccadilly peered out. In the deep shadows, his eyes twinkled. He saw Morgan and recognized him from the altar chamber. This was the rat who had caught Albert. And here he was, feeding his ugly face and sucking his yellow teeth. Unaware of the hidden mice, Morgan decided it was time to go. He dared not linger. Jupiter had ordered him, and he must obey. With one last sigh as he glanced around his secret place, Morgan lumbered out, dragging his stumpy tail behind him. For five full minutes, the mice remained where they were in case Morgan should return unexpectedly. It was Oswald who eventually forced them out of hiding, a cramp in his leg suddenly becoming too much to bear, and he shot out of the skins, limping and stamping for all he was worth. Look, he cried, and ran to where Morgan had been sitting. The rat had left the divining rod behind. Oswald snatched it up and flourished it proudly. <laughs> Shall we try to find Audrey's brass? It's a shame to go back to the skirtings empty-handed. Oswald was already holding out the rod, waiting and concentrating. It jerked and jumped wildly. It must be very close. Look at it, Piccadilly. Come on, we can find it and get out of here at last. He ran out of a chamber. Piccadilly followed him. In the tunnel, Oswald was already a distance away, running for all he was worth. Oh, no, Piccadilly cried. A madness seemed to have gripped Oswald. The grey mouse ran after him. Oswald hurtled along, stumbling and tripping in his usual ungainly manner. He paid no attention to the pain of his toes as they struck sharp stones or skidded in the puddles. His mind was full of Audrey's mouse brass, and the divining rod pulled him to it. He had no control over it. It was all he could do to keep hold of it. How it tugged and wrestled to be free. He didn't see the passages as he ran down or hear Piccadilly's voice calling to him some distance behind. Piccadilly was uneasy. He didn't know where they were going, but he felt it was dangerous running like a stupid rabbit headlong into peril. A piece of rag was stretched across the path, obscuring the way ahead. Oswald didn't see it and crashed through regardless. Piccadilly saw the dirty cloth and a twinge of weariness clutched suddenly at his stomach. He had to follow Oswald, though and he pushed the rag aside and ran on. They seemed to be in a large chamber littered with sacks, large bundles on the floor, hanging off ledges, piled in corners. Oswald was in the centre, stooping. Piccadilly caught up with him, nimbly hopping over the bundles. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Oswald stared at him with glassy, heavy eyes. He held his head to steady himself as the mania wore off. The divining rod was limp in his paws. Oswald swayed and came out of his trance. At his feet gleamed the mouse brass. Piccadilly looked down and froze. Oswald, coming to his senses at last, blinked and gasped. The chamber they had barged into was the main sleeping quarters of the rats. All about them were hundreds of snoring rats. The sacks they had jumped over were sprawled, sleeping brutes. The mouse brass they had come so far to find was clenched tightly in the cruel claws of a large brown rat. Oswald gulped, <coughs> strapped to the stump of the rat's other arm. Was a peeler. It was Skinner. The sharp talons of his one good arm were twined about the cord that had once held a charm around Audrey's neck. Pick it up, hissed Piccadilly. Oswald shook his head. He didn't want to touch the snoring monster. Let's leave, he implored. Not till we get what we came for. Piccadilly bent down. The heat from the nostrils blew harshly against his arms. He braced himself and gingerly unwound the cord from the claw. A disturbed mumble growled from the rat. The grey mouse paused, waiting to see if the rat stirred, but there was nothing more. Gently, he lifted one of the talons and pulled the cord free. Slowly, he passed the mouse brass to Oswald 
and lowered the sharp talon. Now, he whispered, let's go. One clumsy move and we'll wrap me. With a painful slowness that made every bone of them ache, the two mice edged their way back to the cloth stretched across the entrance. Piccadilly sighed when he reached it and pushed it aside gladly. Oswald hopped over the last rat. He was a scrawny villain with one ear torn off, and he ground his teeth loudly as he slept. But as Oswald neared the partition, an almighty gong boomed throughout the chambers, and the rats awoke. Oswald should have run, but his legs wouldn't respond. He stayed there and whimpered, stricken and frozen. Through a rent in the cloth he saw Piccadilly's urgent face calling him, but it was no use. He was rooted to the spot. Oswald grasped the mouse brass tightly. He saw Skinner rub the sleep out of his eyes and then stare blankly at his empty claw. Ah, where's it gone? Who's had me prize with stinking salt pinched me mouse dangler? Skinner turned to his neighbour and gripped him by the throat. Weren't you, Spiker? I'll gut you and make rope from your entrails. The rat called Spiker eyed the peeler as it swayed menacingly before his face. Keep your boiling, he spat. Haven't got your fucking marble. So far, no one had seen Oswald. All eyes were on the brawl. The mouse felt life return to his legs, and he crept quietly towards the partition. A claw gripped his shoulder. Here! Who are you, then? The rat with the torn ear growled behind him. Stammering, Oswald turned round. The rat grinned. There were bits of rotten green in his long teeth. Do I, eh? He sneered, looking Oswald up and down. An odd light flickered in the rat's eyes. Where'd you get this, then? He said, pointing to the green scar. Trophy, is it? You'll not get many of them in the mine. Oswald was totally puzzled, and then he realised what had happened. He had been mistaken for a young rat. His pride was somewhat injured by this insult, but it was hardly the time to complain. The rat turned to see the fight between Skinner and Spiker. Oswald shot a glance at the hole in the rag. Piccadilly was bewildered. It'll never work, the city mouse mouthed. Oswald pulled a, what can I do? face, and Piccadilly mimed to him to hide his obvious mouse hair and ears. Oswald quickly removed a scarf from his neck and tied it up about his head. Then he tucked the mouse brass under it. I'll get help, Piccadilly assured him, and the grey mouse turned and ran back down the passage as fast as he could. The scuffle in the chamber ended suddenly. Uh, there was some cheering, others muttered, but Spiker said nothing. He fell dead to the ground, a great slit up his middle. I'll finish the job later, <laughs> said Skinner, as he licked his bloody device clean. I ate both of them. Should both have copped it, mumbled the rat next to Oswald. Puss buckets they are. He tore the cloth aside and made to stomp through, but he turned to Oswald and said, You'd best stick with me first, eh? I'll show you the ropes. We'll get on fine, you and me, mates, together. Be old cronies this time next shift. You'd like that, wouldn't you, lad? He brought his face closer. Oswald nodded hurriedly. <laughs> Name's Finn. Oh, I'm... <sighs> Oswald coughed and tried to sound harsh and croaky like a rat whilst he fumbled for a suitably rattish name. I'm... <laughs> Whitey. <clears> hmm. <throat> Most like... Finn smiled unpleasantly. I'll show you the mine, whitey lad. Oswald followed the scrawny rats into even greater danger. The night air was cool and refreshing. Twit quickly recovered from the stifling atmosphere of the sewers as the breeze ruffled his fur slightly and blew away the memory of the cloying, sweaty rat smell. Thomas the midship mouse had led him back through the sewers a slightly different way to the one they took when they entered them. The two mice had surfaced near the park where great iron gates kept out unwanted visitors in the night. 
They ducked under the ironwork and pattered along. Great trees stood black against the sky, looming above them so high it hurt to its neck to look at them. See yonder hill? Thomas nodded to the dark mass that rose to their left. That strange dome building that sits on the top is for looking into the sky. I. Oh, yes, Twit said brightly. The bats told me it was to see the stars, but I can see them anyways. I. They reached the top of the hill, where it leveled out into an expansive plateau. The road split into three. Thomas took the right fork. Not far now, he said. Black Heath is just through these gates. What do you think we'll find there? Thomas shrugged. No, I suppose. I just want to look-see. The Heath was a dark place, a vast area of flat grassland surrounded by roads and buildings. A few paths crossed the breadth of the Heath, but hardly any trees grew there. It was a disturbing place. Nothing stirred, and only the stars gazed down on it. The grass was short. It only came up to Twit's tummy. Here and there, patches grew darker than the rest, only in perfect circles. Twit went up to one of the dark bands. Strange this is, he murmured. Tis actually a deeper colour in the very blade of the grass. And look, toadstools do grow in the circles. Nowhere else, only in among the dark grass rings. Thomas didn't like the look of them. I had mushrooms once. Nice and tasty they were, too. But I wouldn't touch those pale excuses with a barge pole. He eyed them disdainfully. No, they don't smell too good, Twit added, sniffing them tentatively. Poisonous, most like. He pulled a face. What's in the soil to cause it, I'm thinking, Thomas muttered. On what do they feed to turn out so? Twit was staring out onto the heath. Something had caught his eye. It was a small dot of light. It's so quiet here, Thomas went on. Hushed and lulled like a sea be calmed. What are you looking at, matey? Twit pointed. There. You see that there light a-winking? Tis only small. Oh, aye, said Thomas. Let's take a peep. Only we ought to go quiet. There's summat about this place as makes me tail twitch. Morgan spat on the ground. He had walked a long way and was not used to it. He carried the sack on his back. Go to the heath, Jupiter had commanded him. So there he was. He couldn't afford to displease his majesty. He had been pushing it of late. Too many things were going wrong, and all the lads at that digging. It was difficult to keep them at it. His thoughts turned to the last thing that Jupiter had told him before sending him out of the sewers. I shall meet you there, he had said. Morgan wondered if this meant that he would get to see his lord at last. Go to the center and remove the crystal from the sack, had been Jupiter's instructions. Well... He judged this to be fairly central. He put down the sack, opened the neck, and groped around inside. Finally, he fished out the smooth, heavy, round object. Blast it! What do you want this rubbish for? It was the crystal ball of Madame Akikuyu. Morgan tried hard to remember his next instruction. It was to find a ring in the grass, the largest there was, and place the globe inside. What a tough thing to do. Nevertheless... He made sure he followed the instructions to the letter. The crystal was put in a large, round ring. Morgan stepped out of the ring and said the words he had committed to memory. Jupiter, Lord of all, in darkness's name, come forth. He bowed as he had been told to and waited for the creature with two heads to step forward from a hiding place. In that, Morgan was disappointed, but all thought was soon driven from him as a blinding flash seared his eyes. Madame Akikuyu's crystal was burning. Morgan peered up. There, in the dark ring, the glass globe was on fire. No, the flame was within the crystal. It lapped the insides, yet there was no sign of a glass getting scorched, and no smoke issued from it. Morgan gazed at it dumbly, and then he saw two small points of red amongst the flames. 
Gradually, these grew larger, floating orbs of scarlet brilliance blazing away far brighter than the other fire. Morgan realized he was looking at two fiery eyes. Jupiter stared out of the crystal at him. Oh, my lord of the night, he mumbled as his knees shook and his legs gave way in fright. What powers Jupiter possessed? Morgan had never dreamed they were this strong. My lord, he ventured, can you hear me? He was answered by a hollow, mocking laugh from the crystal. Ha, ha, ha! Thomas and Twit had crept silently along the ground until they could see the source of the light. Twit smothered a gasp, and even Thomas, the stout mariner, was taken aback at what he saw. The two mice were at the edge of one of the rings, concealed in the grass from the rat standing before them. Madame Akikuyu's crystal was held high over his head. Two burning, cruel eyes were suspended in the heart of the globe. The voice of Jupiter came from the middle of the flames, and Twit quailed in his hiding place. Mark out the circle, Morgan! It snarled harshly. The first stage must be completed tonight. The rat placed the crystal on the ground and moved hurriedly to a bundle of sacking outside the ring. Move them inside, hissed Jupiter. Once complete, the circle must not be broken. Morgan hauled the bundle within the ring. The flickering light from the crystal licked across the sack as the rat foraged inside, brought out four shin bones and flourished them proudly. Thomas covered his eyes. They were the bones of mice. That's right, Jupiter hissed, and the fire rippled softly in the globe. Trace the circle round with the notched bone, then place the others at the compass points, saving that one for the north. And take great care if you value your neck. Morgan carefully completed the task. Now the candle, uttered Jupiter. The rat searched in the sack once more and fished out a short, thick candle. It was a dull brown color, and Morgan gave it a cautious sniff. He licked his teeth appreciatively. Do not even try, threatened the disembodied voice. I have spent a long time distilling the substance from which that candle is made. It is not a common wax. Hold it up. The rat did as he was told and waited. The flaming eyes in the crystal narrowed and the voice became low, too low to hear. Suddenly the fire in the glass leaped out in a whip of blazing flame. It snaked round the startled Morgan, who closed his eyes and cowered. The fire flared above him, and in a splutter of sparks, the strange candle was lit. Observe, said Jupiter. You may put it to the north. Morgan took the guttering candle to the edge of a circle and placed it next to the notched bone. The candle gave off a thick pall of brown, evil-smelling smoke. Now, bring out the parcel. Once more, Morgan did as he was told. It was a heavy package, wrapped around with brown paper through which sticky grease was oozing. Remove the contents carefully. Separate the pieces into four and put them with the bones. Twit and Thomas could hear Morgan grumbling as he obeyed. What is it? asked the field mouse. I can't see what's in his hands. You don't want to know, replied Thomas. I can scarce believe it. This is an awful evil thing to witness. There, master, tis John, said Morgan, wiping his claws on his belly. Now, Morgan, lift me, lift the crystal over your head, and prepare yourself. The globe was seized in sharp claws and raised above the rat's head. The fire within shone into the night as the eyes opened wide. With fire I summon thee, called Jupiter. The candle flared abruptly and the smoke became a dark plume above them. With mandrake I woo thee. A scream came from the air. Thomas pulled to it away. Come. We dare not linger for this. We must return you to your friends. 
But this... Twit stammered. He didn't understand the terrible danger they were in. Pay no heed and stop your ears if you ever want to sleep again, my lad. The mice ran from the middle of the heath with as much speed as they could get from their trembling legs. Nervously, Twit glanced back. Whatever had been taking place must have been truly horrible to scare sturdy Thomas. Back in the magic circle, Jupiter finished his last conjuration. And with bones, I order thee, he shouted exultantly. Morgan looked cautiously around, trying not to tremble. Oh, how he had underestimated Jupiter's powers. They seemed to be growing daily. Or was he merely showing his full strength at last? Morgan stiffened. It was windy. Before, there had been a slight breeze, but now... How that wind howled! It wasn't natural. The candle flame was blown here and there, battered down by the wind, but not extinguished. Oh, breath from the darkest night! Jupiter began again. Take the form I have designed. Kiss the final embrace and step down from your throne in the void. Morgan was nearly knocked off his feet by the rending gale. It stampeded out from the black sky and whirled about the circle. Above Morgan's head, the eyes in the crystal shot beams of red, flickering light upwards, and luminous vapors trailed off the glass in great swirls. The four clusters of objects that he had placed around the circle suddenly burst into flames, and presently there was a ring of fire surrounding him. But the fire was a sickly purple in color, with pulses of red running through. A red that looked like rivers of blood. The thick, dark smoke swirled over the flames and rose high into the darkness. Morgan heard voices in the air. They whistled and yelled, but they were hollow sounds with no body. He began to see forms in the ever-moving smoke. Little figures, faint and indistinct, darted through the dark cloud. The empty voices grew louder as they formed bodies to house themselves in. Soon the smoke was writhing with them. Wild was the dance around the circle. The figures wheeled in mad frenzies. The purple flames suddenly became yellow and leaped higher. With a yell, the creatures raced through them, emerging as yellow, glowing things themselves. Faster and faster they spun, until Morgan's head ached. He wished he had never come to this nightmare place. Enough! cried Jupiter above the din. Immediately there was silence and the forms hung foggily in the air, waiting for his commands. Do your work, he ordered. A shout went up amongst them all, and at once they all dived to the ground, sinking into the soil and vanishing with a great hiss like a thousand snakes. The flames around the circle reached up suddenly very high. Morgan found himself inside a raging column of bright fire, and then they too disappeared. The bones and the other items had gone. Morgan looked for them, but there was no trace of anything. He had the unpleasant idea that they had been consumed. There was no sign to suggest the ritual that had just taken place. All was quiet, and a light breeze swung the rat's earring gently to and fro. Is it over now, my lord? He ventured warily. Yes. Yeah said Jupiter. For the moment, you can return to my chamber. Shaking, Morgan put the crystal in the sack and began the journey to the sewers. When one-eyed Jake and his lads pulled Audrey roughly through the grill, she fainted. Slumped over Jake's shoulder, she woke from her dark dreams into a reality that was far worse. Her eyelids fluttered. Look there, Jake, nodded Flet. The skirt's waking. Is she now? Jake pulled Audrey down from his shoulder and set her on her feet. The mouse sagged to the floor. Jake grabbed her lace collar and dragged her up again. Coughing, Audrey glared at him. Where are you taking me? she demanded. Jake stroked his whiskers and chuckled. <laughs> Got some guts, ain't ya? A proper Miss Uppity. 
Let's just say, me dear, you're off to meet someone who's right keen to see you. He pushed her in front of him and the party set off. Fletch followed Jake and behind him came leering Mackie. Behind him was Vinegar Pete. Pete had a bald patch on his egg-shaped head and a perpetually sour expression on his face, as though he was continuously chewing lemons. Bringing up the rear were three old rats. On their backs they carried sacks which contained provisions. The three rats had lost their youth and the rebellious vigour that went with it. They had accepted their orders and their burdens with resignation. At least they would be fed, and work in the mines for them at least was postponed. Suddenly, one of the old rats gave a shout. There was a moment of confusion. The rat cried out in his thin, cracked voice, and above it floated a high, surprised yell. Piccadilly had run all the way from the sleeping chamber where he had left Oswald, and on turning round a blind corner, slammed into the doddery old rat. Shock and surprise registered on both faces before the grey mouse turned and fled up the tunnel. He never even saw Audrey at the front of the rat pack. Audrey recognised his voice, though, and it gave her courage. She saw the bewilderment of the rats as Jake laid into the one who had let Piccadilly escape. It was a grey, said Fletch dryly. Wear it now, spat Jake angrily. So the other fools lost him. Mackie and Pete, you get him alive, right? The two rats whooped and darted up the tunnel after Piccadilly. Bring him back here! Jake shouted. He motioned to the three oldsters. Hey, you foggies! Break out your packs. Might as well stay here till they come back. The old rats pulled the sacks from their backs and sat down, their bones cracking as they slouched over the bags. Jake reached over and hauled one of the sacks to himself. He opened it, stuck his snout in, and ferreted about inside. Audrey began to edge away from him. A stern tap of his claws on the ground stopped her. Don't be so keen to go, he said. He leant forward. Where's your dangler, he asked. I thought all you squeak as Adam. He reached out to the place where the mouse brass should have been. Audrey flinched from him. I, lo I lost it, she stammered. Jake belched. Uh, uh, Tell me, uh, uh, he said. What is it, you lot worship? Is it our majesty? Audrey looked up proudly and held his gaze steadily. We honour the green mouse, she answered. Do you know why honour? I believe so, she said. You worship Jupiter in his stinking darkness. Jake's eyes narrowed. Yes, we do. He's the lord of all. There was a strange bitterness in the way he said it. He stood up and dragged Audrey to her feet. With his other claw, he took up one of the burning torches. We'll not be long, uh, he told Fletch. Stay here and wait for the others. He turned the corner that Piccadilly had run so blindly round, pulling Audrey harshly. I'll show you what real things there are, he mumbled. It was damp in the tunnel, and moss grew down the walls in sickly pale clumps. Jake strode up to one large patch and drew it aside. There was a passage beyond the moss, leading steeply down. Jake pushed Audrey inside and followed after her. The mouse scrambled down the passage and waited at the bottom. She wondered wildly where she was being taken and why. Jake grasped her paw again and her skin crawled at his touch. Not far now, lovely, <coughs> he said. The bricks were different now. They were older and larger than those in the main sewer. Audrey knew she was walking into a very ancient place. They entered a great room. Jake let go of her and bowed before something she couldn't see. Oh, lords and lady, he said reverently. He turned on Audrey savagely. Kneel, he roared. She fell to her knees. Jake flourished the torch and strode to the far wall of the room. There were three altars, covered in the mouldering remains of some old offerings. Above them, painted in the primitive rat manner, were three figures. Jake went to the first. It was a crouching rat with no head. At its feet were many heads. Before his highness came all those years ago, 
Jake said, with the wide eye of a fanatic. There were the three gods of the rats, now forgotten by all save a few dedicated ones like myself. We come here from time to time and do what worship we can. Until he goes, it won't be safe. See? Who's that? asked Audrey. Why hasn't he got a head? That's Balkan, the artful one. He wears whatever head he likes. A master of disguise he is. A great liar. Jake moved to the second altar. The picture above it was of a female rat with a tooth necklace and a third eye daubed on her forehead. Tassels hung from her ears. This is Mab, the sleep visitor. She comes in dreams and urges us to war. A dark one she is. Revels in slaughter. <laughs> he went to the last altar. Audrey gasped when the torch revealed the painting. It was a rat with great horns protruding from his forehead and a mass of red hair curled like a mane about him. The tail of this figure was forked and at his feet lay a mass of bloody skeletons. Lord Hob, breathed Jake, Warbringer. He turned to Audrey. These are the true gods of the rats. Fighting and slaughter's what we want, not digging in poxy mines. Who makes you do that? His eye and stinking mightiness, that's who. Oh, those two pairs of eyes he has blazing at everyone, red and yellow. He ain't our proper lord. It's just that everyone's scared of him. Well, no long for, eh? We ain't workers. We want blood on our knives. Audrey backed away. She had to get out of this terrible place. Jake placed the torch on Lord Hobb's altar and advanced towards her an evil gleam in his eye. Suddenly, a voice spoke behind her. So this is it. Fletch spat on the floor. You dirty even Jake! With a wild yell, Jake leapt at the rat, teeth bared. They growled and bit each other. Fur came out in lumps and claws scored out trails of blood. Audrey jumped away from them. Gradually she eased herself back towards the door, keeping her eyes on the bitter rat fight. Fletch gripped Jake by the throat, clearing a space for his teeth to bite out his windpipe. But Jake writhed and lashed about and knocked him away with his tail. Fletch scampered to the altar, picked up the flaming torch, then waved it threateningly before the one-eyed rat. I'll put out the other one, he taunted. Oh, blind Jake you'll be, eaten dung and kicked around. They circled each other warily. Then Jake sprang. With his head down, he charged and butted Fletch in the stomach. The torch fell from his claws, and he was rammed against the altar of Balkan. The flames sent their shadows high into the ceiling as grotesque, wrestling shapes. Jake had Fletch pinned against the stone altar, and the wind was knocked out of him. As he struggled for breath, Jake snatched up the torch and plunged it deep into his enemy. Audrey turned and scrabbled as fast as she could up the steep passage. Loose stones rattled down as she raced upwards. At the entrance, she pulled aside the wet moss and breathed deeply, her heart fluttering. Jake been having some fun with you, sweet meat. The harsh voice startled Audrey completely, and she yelped. She had been oblivious to everything except escaping that evil temple. Now she turned to find leering Mackie goggling at her. Is Fletchy down there and all? Audrey shook her head, dumbly. Fletch is dead. She managed at last. Jake killed him. Mackie nodded. Thought that would happen. Finishing him off down there, is he? He licked his lips, then fixed his eyes on Audrey. We're bored down there. Proper cheesed off we are. That grey gave us the slip. Blast him! He grabbed her arm and pulled her down the tunnel to rejoin the three old rats and Vinegar Pete, staring sulkily into a flickering fire. Little Miss Sweetmeat here is going to do some entertaining. <laughs> the rats began to clap. Mackie took hold of Audrey's paws and whirled her round. At first she thought he was going to hurl her into the sewer water, but then she realised with a shock that the ugly beast was dancing with her. He moved in time to the clapping of the others with great, heavy, lumbering steps. Audrey had to be very nimble to avoid his big feet crushing hers. 
There's a turn, called Vinegar Pete eagerly. Sorry, Petey, but it's me next, said a voice in the darkness. Mackie stopped dancing. Audrey's heart missed a beat as one-eyed Jake stepped up to her. With Fletch's blood splashed all over his body, he looked like a creature of a nightmare. He smiled, and his mouth was red and wet. Then he grabbed Audrey's paws. His claws were sticky with blood, and Audrey cried out at the feel of them. Start your clapping again, Jake said. The beat began. Jake twirled Audrey about. Then he spun her out and in. Then they danced round in a ring. Faster, he yelled. Leave her alone. Suddenly, Jake stopped, and Audrey rolled into a corner, cracking her elbow on the brickwork. Madame Akikuyu stepped over the old rats, cuffing them about the head as she did so. I said, leave the mouselet be, she said coolly. No one stops me, you old witch. Get back to your peddling and fortune telling. Madame Akikuyu reached smartly into her bag and threw some dust into Jake's eye. He fell back howling, temporarily blinded. Come to me, mouselet. Akikuyu beckoned to Audrey. See what I return to you. She held up two silver bells, the same one she had taken as payment on their first meeting. Audrey ran to her almost gladly and took the bells. Don't just sit there, Pete, Mackie, rip the witch apart. The two rats, who until now had looked on in amazement, edged cautiously forward. I think not, boys, said Madame Akikuyu. She delved into her bag once more and this time brought out a handful of herbs. She cast them into the fire. The flames spluttered and crackled. Bright white stars sizzled and with a whoosh. The flame shot up to the ceiling and scorched it black. Mackie and Pete stared fearfully at the blazing column before them. She is a witch, Vinegar Pete muttered. I have Lord Jupiter's favour, admitted Madame Akikuyu proudly. Look there. Mackie pointed to the roaring, surging pillar of fire. In its centre, two circles formed and shone out brighter than the surrounding flames. Mercy on us, Pete cried. The old rats fell on their faces and groveled in the dirt. The eyes of Jupiter were before them. And that's the end of side three. Hear me, the rich, velvety voice called to them from the flames. Akikuyu will now complete the simple task I set for you. You have failed me, and I am greatly disappointed in you all. It weren't our fault, wailed Mackie. It was Jake. He made us stop. The fiery eyes became slits. Where is Jake? Jupiter asked softly. The one-eyed rat came forward. He bowed respectfully. Oh, gracious Lord, he began. I was delayed by their incompetence. The lads here are not the able folk I trusted them to be. They wrong me in the blame. It does not lie with me. Jake, Jupiter interrupted. You forget. I know all that goes on in my realm. You worship false idols, not your true master. Jake fell on his knees. Oh no, Dark Magnificence. It was Fletch, not me, that went down in that poxy temple. I followed him. That's why I struck him. I knew you wouldn't like what he was doing honest. The fire ran red, and Jupiter roared, Enough, Jake. I have done with you. I see and hear all. I have sentenced you. A spark from the fire flew out and landed on the end of Jake's tail. He howled and stamped on it, but it took hold and would not be extinguished. A bright yellow ring slowly spread around the tail and began to creep up towards him. Horrified, Jake saw that where the bright sizzling ring had been, only ash remained. The ash that once was the end of his tail dropped as grey dust on the floor, and still the smouldering ring advanced. Soon it will reach your body, Jake, then at last your head. 
Audrey hid behind Madame Akikuyu. She buried her nose in her paws, but the acrid smell of singed fur found her nose. Bit by bit, Jake's tail was consumed. No, no, he screamed. The smoking ring was near his body now, his tail a mound of grey ash on the ground. I'll put it out, he yelled wildly. I'll get away from you and jump into the water. Jake ran from them and dashed round the corner away from the fiery eyes. Audrey peeped out between her paws. She hoped Jake would be able to put it out in time. A sudden last scream echoed in the tunnel and was abruptly cut off. Jake had not made it. Audrey had no time to feel sorry for him. Jupiter spoke to Madame Akikuyu. Have you the girl mouse there? Yes, she is here. Come out, mouselet. She ushered Audrey before her. The mouse stared, terrified at those eyes that burn in the fire. Nothing could save her now. Where is she, Akekuyu? asked Jupiter irritably. But, Lord, the mouselet stands in front of you. You lie. The eyes searched for Audrey, but were unable to focus on her. I do not lie. She is here. Shadows gather about her. I cannot pierce them. She must be shielded by some protective spell. Akikuyu smacked Audrey on the back of her head. Stop funny business and let the High One see you. Audrey was bewildered. She knew of no spell. Wherever you are, know that there are no powers to match mine. I have waited long and grown mighty. The eyes flashed, still hunting for her, but the shadows that clouded over Audrey were too thick. Akekuyu, bring the mouse directly to me. Before my true person, whatever charm she has woven about herself shall be broken, and her impudence suitably rewarded. I obey, Lord, Akekuyu bowed. I make no error in delivery. Make haste, the eyes closed, and the fire died suddenly. Madame Akekuyu looked at Audrey. What magic have you? she asked. None, really. I don't understand what happened. Hmm, considered Akikuyu. You come with me now. Not far to go. Finn passed Oswald an old bent spoon. Here, Whitey, use this to dig with, he said. They had marched into the rat mine. The air was stale with the rank smell of sweat and blood. With horror, Oswald noticed several bodies amongst the rubble. They were old, wizened rats, too thin to be of any more use. Oswald avoided the evil stares that some of the other rats were giving him as they brushed past. He heard some of them sniggering. How are you keeping, Finn? asked one with amusement. Stick it, rapped Finn. What's that then? Piece of chalk? Oswald blinked but said nothing. It's death warmed up. You don't pay no mind to him, said Finn. Snot gobblers they are. No, it's the likes of him you don't want to bring yourself to the attention of. A huge rat had gone by. He was strong, and his coat was a sleek, dark brown. Oswald looked at the newcomer's face and gasped. His mouth, he stammered. Shh, Finn hushed him quickly. Look as though you're doing summit for his seizure. The rat moved on. His great claws were long and sharp. His thick, mighty tail swished behind him, but as for his face... The rat had a permanent, ghastly grin, which showed all of his cruel teeth. It was a frightening expression that he could never change. That Smiler, but don't let him hear you call him that. One of the best diggers he is, uses his bare claws. That's why he stays up at the front of the mine face. But what happened to his mouth? asked Oswald, appalled. Finn smiled twitchingly. When he were a young un, he lied to Morgan, so the old stump had his lips sliced off. Bet he regrets it now, though, seeing as our smiler turned out to be so big and strong. Doesn't ah give Morgan dirty looks when he goes past? You should see the scabby goon tremble. Oswald stared at Smiler's broad back as he stomped away. The world of the rats was a nightmare of vicious backstabbing.
How many hours or days would he be able to keep up the pretense of being a rat? The gong boomed and echoed through the mine. Start digging, lad, said Finn, throwing a sack over his bony shoulder. I lugged the freshly dug stuff away from the face. See you later. Just keep your head down. Finn tramped away. Oswald stuck the ground with a spoon. He made no impression on it whatever. The soil was hard and stony. He pushed the spoon and bashed it on the floor, but nothing gave. He looked around him. All the others were working busily, striking the ground and gouging out the earth. The slow work song began. He hacked at the ground. A small stone showed signs of budging, so he gave this his full attention. The end of the spoon dug into his soft paws till they blistered and bled, but at last the stone moved. Minutes dragged by sluggishly. The endless chant droned on. Oswald managed to dig out a small heap of earth, and he gazed at it proudly. That's a neat pile, whitey lad, said Finn. Put your back into it a bit more, though. Morgan will be here soon to see how things are going. You'd best have more dug by then. Finn was about to leave with another full sack when Oswald asked the question that had been troubling him. What are we digging for? Finn cackled grimly. <laughs> Not heard the rumours, see? No, maybe you wouldn't. Some say one thing, others some are different. The way I guess it, old Jupiter is after some treasure or other. Just hope it's worth it. Finn trudged off. Oswald's limbs ached, his paws were calloused and blistered, and the dirt had got into them and stung. His head throbbed and beads of perspiration trickled from under his scarf. Even Smiler had begun to slow down. His great arms rose less frequently, and the amount of soil behind him took longer to pile up. Skinner slouched over a heap of earth and yawned loudly. This work stinks, he cursed. A pox on this balmy mine. Several other tired rats joined him. They flung down their tools and talked suddenly. They wanted to know what they were doing all this digging for and what they would be getting out of it. Oswald listened to their grumbles but pretended to work. Always the same questions, Finn said suddenly. Oswald didn't like the rat's habit of creeping up like that. They all want summit out of this dump. Expect too much, they do. Useless great lumps. Here's me breaking me back with this lummocking great sack of dirt. He pulled a pained expression and allowed the sack to fall to the floor. No good. Can't lug it one step more. He looked at Oswald craftily. Do us a favour, whitey chum. Carry this here load for us just this once. Cautiously, Oswald picked up the heavy sack. It nearly knocked him over when he heaved it over his shoulder. Finn watched him, and something like a triumphant smile spread across his face. That's right, whitey. You me old mates now, this way. The rat set off down the mine, and slowly Oswald followed. Past the shoveling, raking rats, the albino mouse laboured, the load on his back weighing him down horribly. Finn was always just ahead, urging him on, encouraging him excitedly. Oswald lumbered as fast as he could, but his legs were wobbly and his back ached with the weight of a sack. Getting too much for you, is it, Whitey? inquired the rat, rubbing his one ear gleefully. Good job I'm here, then. I know a shortcut. Just round the corner there, cuts the trapes by half. Rounded a bend, and Oswald noticed a small passage leading off from the main tunnel. It was dark and empty. He didn't like the look of it. He shook his head. No, he gasped. I think I can make it. Finn laughed. <laughs> Don't kid me, Whitey. You look all done in. That scarf of yours has eaten up your head too much. I'll take it off for you. Oswald coughed in panic. The other rats in the tunnel were looking at them now and without his scarf, one of them was bound to recognise him as a mouse. No, I'll, 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 I'll go with you down there, he stammered quickly. Finn grinned widely. Thought you might. He entered the small passage, and Oswald followed. It was dark. No torches burned on the walls, and the air was cold and stuffy. Finn's voice echoed along the passage to him. He seemed far ahead, 
Come on, whitey lad. Oswald gulped. <coughs> he felt like a small fly stumbling into the heart of a dark web, and thin was the spider. Nervously, he plodded on, his heart fluttering. Suddenly, he crashed into a solid wall. The tunnel was a dead end. Blindly, he groped around, panic bubbling up inside him. Where was Finn? Oswald turned his back to the wall and saw two pale points of light approaching. They were Finn's eyes, lit with a mad hunger. He doubled back and waited for Oswald to pass him in the dark and to be trapped. Ah, oh, whitey boy. I've been so patient with you. Yes, Finn's not as daft as he makes out. I saw your little mousy ears when I woke up. They had my mouth watering, they did. Ooh, crispy mouse ears, gorgeous. But them lot would have had you, and poor Finn would get nothing. So I waited and waited. Oswald cried out in terror. The two pale circles drew closer. A cold gleam of metal flashed as Finn pulled out his knife. The blade glittered icily as he threw it from claw to claw, taunting his victim. Suddenly, the ground shook and the passage trembled and quivered. Another blasted roof fall, said Finn. Still, they'll be running round like ants for ages in there now. Give me time to have a nice relaxed breakfast. But first, I gotta peel ya. The circles narrowed and Finn lunged forward, knife held high and ready to strike. Oswald dodged, and Finn cursed passionately. Damn your stinking hide, he said, flourishing the knife once more. But the albino ducked, and the blade smote the wall with a scrape of sparks. Finn's free claw scrabbled around to catch Oswald and keep him still. Oswald nipped here and there, trying to get past the rat and escape. Gotcha! A claw gripped him tightly by the throat, pinning him to the wall. In a mad frenzy, Oswald kicked Finn hard on the shin and reached for the knife arm. He bit it hard. Arrgh! cried the rat in surprise, and the knife fell clattering to the floor, where it got wedged blade upwards between two stones. Finn thrashed out with both his claws in a wild rage, screaming oaths and snapping his jaws together. Oswald tripped over the full sack of dirt and sprawled on the floor. Finn jumped on top of him and gouged three long lines in his side. Oswald howled and smashed his elbow into Finn's stomach. The breath whistled through his teeth, and he staggered to his feet, wheezing in agony. Seizing this chance, Oswald gave him an almighty shove. Finn staggered, then tripped over the sack, landing on the upturned knife. He screamed as the blade pierced his ribs. For a moment he writhed in agony and then was still. Oswald had killed him. The mouse was distraught. He had not meant for that to happen. All he wanted to do now was to get away. He ran down the passage, leaving Finn in a widening pool of dark blood. Out of the gloom, Oswald ran, out of the small passage and into the mine. Everywhere was confusion and noise. Rats ran here and there with torches. The cave-in had happened just where Oswald had been digging. What a shock he realised that Finn had probably saved his life by leading him away when he did. Twenty snuffed it, the rats were saying. I'm not sticking around for the rest of it to fall in, nor me. The cry was taken up by all the rats in the mine. Their minds were made up no more work for them. Oswald crept down the tunnel. He knew that no one would notice him in all the confusion. The rats behind him were shouting loudly now and had begun marching down the tunnel behind him. Oswald scampered along as fast as he could to avoid getting caught by them. He belted round a corner and ran smack into Morgan, whose face was grim and frightening to look on. He glared down at Oswald, then stared beyond him up the tunnel where the ruddy glow of torches bobbed nearer. Insurrection, is it? Is that what's in their wooden heads? Well, no more. They're going to feel the bites of his lordship. He's ready for them now. Morgan was carrying a sack in which a strange round object bulged. Get back in there, he hissed at Oswald, if you want to save your fur. Oswald scrambled back along the tunnel. There was something terrible about Morgan. He seemed cloaked in a shadow of evil power that made him seem taller than before. 
His eyes were like cruel spears, and they stabbed out ferociously. Oswald felt that he would rather face the mutinous rats that marched towards him, their torches held high and their tempers flaring. What's this? they cried as they saw Oswald stumbling towards them. It's wishy-washy. Where are you off to, pasty? Oswald stammered and pointed down the tunnel. Morgan's coming, he exclaimed. Oh, is he now? Ain't we the lucky lads? Old Patchy's coming to see us. That's considerate of him. Pull him to bits, rip his head off. Smiler the giant was among the mob, and he grinned more than usual. Yarsh, he drawled in his awkward, sploshy way. I'll rip his tongue out and eat it. Morgan turned the corner and strode up to the mob. Well, lads, no work in. Not time to lay off yet. As he spoke, he paced up and down, looking at each of them menacingly. One by one, the rats fell silent. Even Smiler stopped laughing. This was new to them. Morgan had never been brave or stupid. They wondered why he was so confident. When all was hushed, Morgan spoke softly, so that they had to strain their ears to listen. How dare you threaten me, he sneered. Remove these thoughts of revolt from your adult brains and bow down before the Black Prince of Nightmare. Beg his forgiveness. I am his right hand, his servant. Raise a claw against me and you challenge him. He is lord of all. Do you think he hides in a dark portal idle and ignorant? His eyes are everywhere, all around, all seeing, all knowing. The rats considered this uneasily. Morgan pushed past them like a high priest speaking to the pagan rabble. Return to your places and be honoured that the work you do is for his greater glory. A pox on the stinking work, shouted a raucous voice. Morgan looked over the crowd. Approaching them was Skinner. The rats turned to see what he had to say. We choke and die in roof falls. For what? He spat bitterly. We break our backs. For what? He punched the air with his fists. I'll tell you for what. For some fat freak who sits in that chamber laughing his whiskers off at us. The work keeps us busy. It stops us asking too many questions like, Who is this Jupiter? And why won't he come out? I'll tell you why. Because he's a fraud. Some old codger who's got it good. The crowd nodded at that and began to grumble. Soon they were all waving their fists in the air angrily. The piebald rat regarded the mob in disgust. You fools, he cried. You know nothing of the power of Jupiter, he pointed at Skinner. But you're the biggest fool of all. Morgan reached into his sack and brought out Madame Akikuyu's crystal. The mirth that the sight of this brought quickly died away as flames flared inside it and two eyes of red fire blazed out. The voice of Jupiter boomed over their astonished heads. I am your lord. The rats fell on their faces in terror. Oswald trembled and sank to his knees, stricken with horror. I am your lord, Jupiter called again. I have been generous and lenient in the past, but now you have angered me. I should bring a terrible doom on you all. Morgan raised the burning crystal above his head, and the light from it shone out blindingly. Without me, you would revert to sucking the slime from the walls. I have blessed you with the thirst for blood and murder, yet you would rise against me. <laughs> I know who the ringleaders are. Behold my vengeance. A halo of white light suddenly formed around the crystal, then shot out in an intense stream of death. Skinner screamed as the white inferno consumed him. The rats fell back in fear. Skinner crackled and sparkled, writhing and waving his arms about in agony. His squeals filled the mine and echoed long after he had died. Abruptly, the fire vanished and a smoking, charred skeleton collapsed on the ground. The peeler fell on top, smashing the brittle charcoal bones. Gasps of horror spread through the crowd. Now, 
I tell you to return to your work before I have to demonstrate my anger further. Do not fan the flames of my wrath. As one, the rats scurried back to their posts. Smiler charged at the mine face with renewed vigour and the dirt flew up around him. Oswald picked up his spoon and dug speedily. He dared not believe what he had just seen and his mind was reeling. Surely nothing could defeat Jupiter. Morgan remained on his lofty vantage point observing the work. The crystal was still in his claws and the eyes continued to burn brightly. Do not think this is a profitless task, Jupiter boomed. There will be rewards for all of you at the finish. Once the tunnel is completed, the treasure that lies under Black Heath shall be yours to enjoy forever. <laughs> Morgan, return to me at my altar. Another problem approaches, one which I shall crush with the utmost pleasure. Oswald was troubled. He had heard Jupiter's words about the treasure, and they worried him, though he didn't know why. He dug away thoughtfully. Somewhere, a nagging doubt was tickling him and wouldn't go away. Smiler smashed through the soil, his great claws ripping out vast clumps of earth. Then one of his claws snapped and flew off. He cursed and inspected the rough soil before him. He picked up some stones and wiped some dirt away. Ah, it stings! he said, examining his skin. It was glowing red and sore. The soil burns, he exclaimed. Several rats went up to him and peered at his burns. Then they stared at the mine face. Smells queer, sniffed one of them. Oh, it burns me nose, yelped another. After having a good whiff, he rubbed his snout. Get tools and see what it is, they suggested. Oswald watched them as he racked his brains. He knew the answer was there, if only he could find it. Something in the soil that burnt. The rats scraped some soil away with spoons and revealed a large white boulder. Leave it out, they called, and pushed their spoons under it. There was something very strange about the boulder. It was perfectly round with odd wiggly lines marked into it. Heave, the rats cried. They all pushed down on their spoons, but nothing happened. Again! The stone budged slightly. All at once, Oswald remembered. Blackheath! Of course! Long, long ago there'd been a terrible plague, the Black Death! The bodies of the dead had been buried under Blackheath and covered with horrible burning quicklime. It was this that was burning Smiler's paws. Stop! Stop! cried Oswald to the rats. You don't know what's happening! We'll all die! Stop! Shut it, pasty heave, lads, cried the rats. With one last effort, the boulder moved, the soil rattled down around it, and the great white object rolled out. It was a grinning human skull. A violent rumble shook the mine as the face gave way, and skulls and bleached bones fell free. Rising with the dust of the disturbed earth was a yellow mist. It billowed out, curling through the empty eye sockets, and seeping through the gaps in teeth. In the dense fog were ugly spectral forms. Jupiter had made the plague a living thing with his black arts, and the mist was writhing with evil life. Oswald shrieked and fled. Panting heavily, he charged down the mine. Smiler looked at the bones dumbfounded. The skull teetered on a chunk of brick, rocking from side to side as though it were shaking its head at him. Then he saw the mist and the wicked faces that formed there. His eyes opened wide as the fog swirled round his legs and stole up behind him. Two smoky arms reached out from the pale ghostly sea and transparent fingers covered his face. Smiler cried out and tried to pull the creature off, but his claws simply passed through the smoke. Higher, the phantom writhed until Smiler was staring into unclean eyes full of unquenchable hunger. He couldn't struggle. The black death overpowered him, and he fell to the floor, the fiend seeping down his mouth. Smiler's mighty tail gave one last thrash before he died. It smacked the skull and sent it spinning down the mine. How Oswald ran! 
All the rats were looking up in bewilderment. They saw an eerie vapour slowly creeping along the ground, engulfing, enveloping, soaking into nooks and niches. Down came the skull, crashing and rolling, bouncing off the walls and flattening the rats who dithered in its way. Oswald heard it rumbling behind him, and he looked over his shoulder in terror. He saw the skull gaining, its grisly face turning as it spun, teeth chipped and smashed when it struck the ground. Oswald tried to run faster. The insidious mist was not far behind, and the plague spectres rose from it like foam on the sea. He heard the chokes and desperate strangled cries of the rats as the plague touched them. He knew that this was the eternal reward Jupiter had promised. The entrance to the mine appeared ahead, and Oswald took heart at the sight. He was very weary, his energies nearly spent. The skull bounced on a rock and snicked Oswald's tail as it landed. He put on an extra burst of speed. The entrance was close now. With one last leap, Oswald jumped clear of the mine. He landed clumsily and struggled to keep his balance. He was on a narrow ledge. Below him, water surged thickly. He turned to face the skull, which seemed to laugh as it rushed towards him. An almighty thud rattled the ledge. The skull had plugged the entrance completely. Not a gap or a chink was there to be seen around it. The demonic mist would not be able to escape. Oswald breathed heavily in relief and bowed his head. He was safe. He glanced upwards and froze. On the adjoining wall of this large chamber was the altar of Jupiter. A hot, sulfurous wind began to blow through the sewers of Detford. It blasted down long-forgotten passages and buffeted the hanging weeds. Audrey hurried along behind Madame Akikuyu. The warm, dry air made it difficult to breathe. When she touched the wall next to her, she drew back in alarm. The bricks are hot, she exclaimed. What's happening? Madame Akikuyu replied without turning round. He is growing, Mouselet, she said. His fiery claw reaches out. The prince he make ready. The fortune teller stretched herself to her full height and puffed out her chest, bursting with her own importance. I have the trust of his majesty. He learns me dark secrets, and I deliver you to him, so bargain is kept. I am worthy of black knowledge. She smiled for a brief moment, happily contemplating the power that would be hers. On a ledge far below the altar of Jupiter, Oswald crouched trembling under some sacks. He was too afraid to move from his hiding place, although he was nearly fainting with heat and fatigue. Something moved in the corner of his eye. Oswald gulped in dismay. It was Audrey, and beside her walked an ugly rat woman. What was she doing on the altar ledge? Madame Akikuyu urged Audrey on. Pray it will be swift, Mouselet, she whispered. The bricks on the altar were scorching, and beneath them the water seethed and bubbled. Audrey's mind was filled by the dark portal. Never had she imagined a darkness so deep, a blackness so eternal. The most terrifying depths of night were locked in that pitch void. Madame Akikuyu stepped over the soft, warm wax that dripped from the candles, and like one drugged, Audrey did the same. Together they stood before the black archway and gazed into the lowering darkness. Most High Majesty, called the fortune teller, I have delivered what was promised. A distant echo rumbled out of the void as Jupiter approached. Two dim points of red flickered in the dark distance and advanced. My thanks, Akikuyu. The soft, rich voice of Jupiter rumbled out of a darkness. So, this is the mouse who would upset my grand design and trample me underfoot. He laughed coldly. Ha! 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 It's as I saw in the crystal. The fortune teller bowed low. I see you now, mouse, taunted the voice. Here... In the heart of my realm, all power succumbs to mine. How did an insignificant creature such as you dare to challenge me? Audrey tossed her head defiantly. I'm Audrey Brown, she shouted. 
and I know nothing of spells or dark magic. I place myself in the protection of the Green Mouse. Whatever you do to me, I know that I shall be received by him. Jupiter laughed. <laughs> Ake Kuyu, leave us and make sure we are not disturbed. I will send for you when I have dispatched Miss Brown to meet her green mouse. The fortune teller bowed again and then glanced quickly at Audrey. Then she lowered her eyes guiltily and hurriedly set off back to the anteroom. Alone, Audrey faced the Lord of the Rats. You have irritated me, Miss Brown. You and that white fool who seek to hinder my plans. I shall deal with him in due course. But first, come up and serve me on this side of the candles. Never. But you must, murmured Jupiter. My will is yours. Climb up, I command you. In horror, Audrey saw her feet begin to move of their own accord. She shuffled nearer the portal and Jupiter chuckled to himself. Oswald clapped his paws over his eyes and fell to his knees sobbing. He knew that Audrey was doomed and that he was powerless to save her. The awful sound of Jupiter's mocking laughter filled the chamber. Oswald, whispered a weak voice close by. Oswald. It repeated softly, only this time it seemed to be coming from far, far away. Fearfully, expecting some trick of Jupiter's, the white mouse peered through his paws. Amidst the rising steam and shimmering heat haze, he could see a dim and vague shape. It glowed with a pale, watery green light. Very faintly, Oswald could make out the form of the green mouse. The mouse brass, Oswald, called the ghostly figure. She needs it now. A great hiss of steam engulfed the figure, and the green light was extinguished. Oswald quickly removed the scarf from around his head, and using it as a slingshot, he whirled the mouse brass over his head several times and catapulted it through the air. It shone and sparkled, spinning like a wheel of golden fire, with a loud ching. The charm clattered on the ledge just behind Audrey. Her feet ceased their steady advance. She shook her head clear of the unwholesome spells. No, she yelled into the blackness. You'll have to come and get me yourself, you two-headed monster. Jupiter let out a thunderous cry of rage and frustration. How dare you! I am Jupiter, dark lord of all. I am the mighty one, the evil one, the father of murders. Verily, I shall come to you. Gladly, I shall tear you to pieces. The force in his voice shook the whole chamber like an earthquake, and mortar cracked and rattled down as he spoke. Behold the majesty of Jupiter, and die. Audrey staggered back as the evil demon began to leave his lair for the first time. She screamed in terror. Below, on his ledge, Oswald saw the great long claws appear from the darkness. A colossal fist covered with matted ginger fur followed them. A horned shadow fell on Audrey as Jupiter brought his enormous head through the portal. Oswald's mouth fell open in a silent scream of naked terror. Out crawled Jupiter. All the rumours, all the legends and all the horror stories were wrong. But the reality of the dark god was much worse. Jupiter did not have two heads. His one huge head was nightmarish enough. The most high satanic majesty was a monstrous cat. So massive and bloated was he that he could barely squeeze himself through the archway. His hideous face was covered with repulsive warts and everywhere poisonous boils poked through his ginger fur. Slowly he pulled his humped back under the arch. Audrey stepped back as far as she could. 
her arms flailing in the air as she balanced precariously on the edge of the altar. But as she did so, her feet touched something cold. She glanced down, and there she saw her gleaming mouse brass. With one movement, she swept it up and held it tightly to herself. Jupiter's iron claws dug into the bricks as he hauled himself forward. Audrey covered her face to shield herself from the stench of his dreadful jaws. Then Jupiter lowered his head. Audrey saw a rush of red as his gaping mouth descended towards her. Instinctively, she flung up her arms and with them the mouse brass. The antique cat charm sparked and flashed, then blazed out like a green beacon. Jupiter reeled back. The green light seared his eyes and blinded him. He shook his huge head and roared. His claw shot out and he pounced on Audrey. From out of nowhere, a small furry bolt fell towards the mouse on the altar. It swooped down and snatched Audrey out of Jupiter's reach and into the air. Held tightly in Orpheo's grip, she soared higher, the mouse brass still shining brightly in her fingers. Jupiter heaved himself out of the portal completely and grasped the narrow ledge. Audrey stared at the giant beast squatting awkwardly on the altar. And then she noticed something else. A small figure was advancing determinedly towards the bloated horror, with a sword in his paw. And then Jupiter hissed angrily as something pricked his side. Thomas, the midship mouse, had stormed angrily into the altar chamber. Piccadilly had found the small passage that he and Albert Brown had first discovered. Grimly, they had marched up to it and looked on the terrible scene unfolding before their eyes. Now Thomas stabbed and swiped at the monstrous cat with his small, sharp sword. Jupiter's flesh was tough, and there was too much of it for the thrusts of Thomas to harm him, but the jabs infuriated him. The corpulent monster's tail flicked dangerously near. Then Gwen Brown rushed out of the passage, brandishing her rapier, and drove it deep into him. Get back, Thomas ordered her. Arthur pulled his mother back along the ledge. It needed both him and Piccadilly to hold her. A rush of leathery wings startled them as Eldritch landed beside them. With a quick smile at Twit, he brushed past them and flew into the chamber. Beating his wings in Jupiter's face, he called to Thomas, who was desperately dodging the thick ginger tail. Oh, seafarer, hailed Eldridge, hold up your paw. He plummeted down and caught hold of Thomas. Then up they flew and circled around Jupiter's head, where the midship mouse's sword deftly pricked and stung the angry cat. Meanwhile... Orpheo flitted down with Audrey, and she ran to her mother's arms. From the anteroom came Morgan, eager to see what all the noise was about. He ran over to the mountainous cat and stared up at it in confusion, his beady eyes blinking. "'My lord!' he cried. "'Is that you, O oh dark one?' Jupiter's reply was instant. His tail fell like a tree trunk on top of Morgan. With a wail, he scrabbled at the ledge, but the ginger mass knocked him in the stomach, bowling him over and flicking him out over the precipice. Into the gulf, Morgan fell, calling for mercy until he crashed into the water and was sucked under. Twit ran onto the ledge and cheered Thomas on, as Eldritch fluttered before Jupiter's malignant face. Thomas sliced into one of the pulsating boils, and a gush of thick yellow poison spurted out. Blind with rage, Jupiter lunged at him but overreached himself and tottered on the brink of the altar. His massive stomach slumped over the edge and dragged him with it. He fell from the ledge. Twit cheered. That's him seen too, said the field mouse as Eldritch fluttered down. Don't speak too soon. Cautioned Thomas, come see. Jupiter had stretched out his thick arms as he had fallen, and his strong claws had bitten into the wall. They scraped and screeched down until they snagged on the chain of a sluice gate. For a moment he hung there, stunned and silent, but gradually his strength returned, and he gripped the chain more securely. Grinning triumphantly, he began to climb. 
His claw slashed out footholds in the brick as he crept upwards. The chain clattered as he put his full weight on it. Slowly, it started to move. Through the rusted metal hoops that held it, the chain ran, and bit by bit, inch by inch, the sluice gates opened. Water ran into the chamber. The level began to rise. The mice on the altar stared down at Jupiter. He's climbing back, exclaimed Mrs. Brown. Two ginger ears appeared over the side of the ledge, and Jupiter's great head reared over it. He laughed at the small creatures who had dared to challenge him, especially the girl. Even now she was staring at him defiantly, completely disregarding the danger all around her. You don't frighten me any more, she said coldly. Before I die, I curse you with all my strength and all my faith in the green mouse. You are an abomination in nature. Choke on my bones. Jupiter smirked at her, and a guttural rumbling came from his throat as he started to purr. His pink tongue slid out and licked the corner of his mouth. Audrey felt the fumes from his jaws on her face. The thought of the pain of being crunched and ground between his teeth flashed through her mind. With a last effort, she cried, This is for my father, and flung the mouse brass towards the beast. For a moment, the charm glittered in space as it turned over and over. Then it hit the ugly great head with an explosion of green fire. Emerald stars burst out, dazzling everyone. The chamber became a turquoise green as fire caught hold in Jupiter's fur. Jupiter squealed in pain. The green flames licked his huge face, and he shook his jowly face to put them out. His huge arms reached up and flayed about, and slowly he began to topple backwards. With an almighty roar of disbelief, he fell. Down he plunged, too far from the wall this time to cling to anything. A giant water spout reared up and touched the ceiling. Waves lashed at the edge, nearly sweeping Audrey clean off. Piccadilly grabbed at her and pulled her away as the water smashed over them. Slowly, Jupiter struggled to the side. You cannot defeat me, he screeched, digging his claws into the brickwork. But deep in the water, something else was stirring. Faint blue lights began to appear around the struggling monster. They glimmered underneath the waves, steadily growing brighter. Audrey rubbed her eyes. What are they? she asked. But when she turned to the others, it was obvious that none of them could see them. No! <sighs> cried Jupiter suddenly. It cannot be! Slowly, he sank deeper into the water. Audrey stood transfixed by this sight that she was witnessing. Ghostly blue arms rose out of the depths, and small paws clutched at the ginger fur. Every mouse that Jupiter had tortured and devoured had returned from the other side to claim him. With the strength of death, they pulled him down. Surprise and panic showed in his face as he thrashed about with his enormous tail. Mewing harshly, he spluttered and choked as the water flowed into his mouth. Staring up at the mice on his altar, Jupiter lost his struggle with the shades of his victims. He foundered, and the water closed over his head. Great bubbles exploded to the surface and ruptured as his vast lungs were spent. His immense bulk sank slowly down into the deep. Jupiter was no more. Audrey stared down at the dark water as it calmed and stilled itself. She saw a patch of shimmering blue rising to the surface, and she caught her breath as the light took shape. From beneath the waves, the shade of Albert Brown smiled at her. A thousand words passed between father and daughter. Then, as if called away, the shimmering phantom lowered his loving eyes and vanished. Oh, mother! gasped Audrey, clutching her mother's arm for support. What is it, love? 
asked Mrs. Brown kindly. Audrey stared over the edge and closed her eyes. Tears streamed down her face. Then she looked into her mother's mild brown eyes and cried, Father's dead. I know, dear. I know, sighed Mrs. Brown, glad that her daughter had finally come to terms with the truth. She held unto her daughter passionately. Audrey's sobs racked both of their bodies. Thomas put his arm around Oswald's shoulder. The albino was very tired and weak. I know just the thing to warm you up, ha <laughs> ha, laughed the midship mouse, winking at Twit. The field mouse giggled at what Mrs. Chitter would say. Piccadilly joined them, and they left the chamber. Arthur caught up with his sister. Phew! What a terrible week it's been. And after all this, you still haven't got your mouse brass. Audrey sighed and glanced back at the altar chamber. Her eyes were raw, but she could see Eldritch and Orpheo huddled together and gazing at her strangely. All she wanted to do was to get back to the skirtings. Goodbye and thank ye, said Twit, waving to the bats. Orpheo lowered his foxy head behind his wings. Until the summer, he said. Darkly.